Hello everyone, today we talk about the Battle of Strasbourg, also known as the Battle of Argentoratum, fought in 357 AD between the Western Roman army under the Caesar, that is Deputy Emperor Julian, and the Alamanni Tribal Confederation led by the joint paramount king Knodemar. The battle took place near Strasbourg, today's Alsace, France, called at the time Argentoratum in Ammianus Marcellinus' account or Argentorata in the Tabula Peutingeriana. Mm -hmm. So today we will make, as usual, a tactical history of the battle that is one of the most important of the period, uh, one of the uh, best in showing the, 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 the valley of the 4th century Roman army, the Constantinian Roman army fundamentally and uh, even if Julian would have not been very happy to, to have it uh, defined in, in, the, in that term um, and we will essentially be reading and commenting the account of Ammianus Marcellinus that is the most important source for the battle then uh, that was close to, he, he actually was even with Julian uh, if I'm not wrong, um, in the initial part of, of the campaign itself hmm? There are other sources, such as Libanius, who wrote a funeral oration for Julian uh, in 363 or 65, probably written later, um, that also was uh, written, I mean, close to the events, as you understand, but doesn't offer this enormous amount of information. And also Zosimus, that instead writes around 500 AD, that provides some, some, some other... Uh, information, but fundamentally the battle is known in its tactical details uh, essentially to Ammianus' uh, account. And uh, the Battle of Strasbourg was fundamentally the climax of Julian's campaigns in 355-357 to evict the barbarian mortiers from Gaul and to restore the Roman defensive line of fortifications along the Rhine which had been largely destroyed during the Roman Civil War of 350-53, uh, where the Alemanni had been invited, actually, by the same Roman Emperor to to fight the usurper Magnensius, but that gave uh, eventually them the, the idea to, to, to go on with that. Uh, they definitely uh, enjoyed it, uh, let's say. Um, and in the years following uh, his victory at Strasbourg, Julian was able to repair and garrison the Rhine forts and impose tributary status on the Germanic tribes beyond the border. And fundamentally, the, um, the uh, Roman Rhine frontier would have uh, uh, held for another uh, 50 years, fundamentally. Today we will not talk about the strategic dimension of the campaign that is also very interesting in itself, but we concentrate strictly on the battle. Maybe one day we will talk in detail about the campaign itself, but it would be too long. So I repeat it this once again, this is going to be a tactical analysis of, of the battle uh, as such. So we have very few contexts, at least, you know, uh, for, uh, for what concerns the, uh, the, uh, the, the, of course, the, the army organizations and uh, certain extra considerations and the general tactics of the 4th century Roman army and the Germanic uh, confederation. We have uh, roughly already introduced the sources, so now we can pass directly to the commanders, the orders of battle, uh, the array, and, and, and eventually to the uh, red of Ammianus. So, um, Julian, uh, protagonist of this battle, um, at this point is, you know, a, a, as you know, a very famous figure, nicknamed by the Church Fathers as the Apostate because of his attempt to repristinate the um, ancient pagan cults and to, to, to marginate Christianity uh, in, uh, in some measure. And it's a very fascinating figure that is... is very highly debated in this sense, mostly from, from the religious point of view, but it's also probably very fascinating in general um, as, as, as an individual himself. He's also nicknamed the, the, the philosopher, uh, stressing uh, his uh, great education, his love for uh, of letters, for example. And uh, he um, was 
in some way, uh, you know, he, he was a very passionate individual indeed, and he acted in legitimately in good faith sometimes in, uh, in a hasty way, um, and he, he was originally actually of the eastern part of the empire, and he was fond of Mitraism, and uh, that had an important part uh, in his life. And um, generally speaking, the tendency, of course, of uh, reverting the Christianization, uh, reversing the, the, the Christianization of the empire would fail. So his intentions have been deemed as utopistic, etc. It's a very big topic, and we're not going to, to discuss it today. But um, in general, he was a, a very important figure that ruled uh, at one point of, on a unified uh, Roman Empire, and that represents one of, in fact, of the most important figures uh, in Roman, uh, in late Roman history. And um, he also remained; uh, he he ruled for for a relatively brief time. He he was elevated to the purple in in Milan in 355 A.D. He when he was 25, and eventually proclaimed Augustus uh, in uh, by his own soldiers in. Uh, Lutetia, that is in Paris, basically, in 360, and uh, he was recognized as the sole emperor of the empire in 361, and he remained so until his death 20 months later near Ctesiphon, um, the, uh, the, the Sassanid capital, during his uh, campaign against, uh, against the Persians. Um, that's, uh, that's also a very important campaign that is, in fact, uh, Considered, if if not for the final death of of the Roman emperor, uh, an astonishing success of the Roman military of the fourth century. Right today, we want to stress, especially this aspect, that the Battle of Strasbourg and the Persian campaign uh, of Julian are uh, basically the greatest proof of the effect of the full effectiveness of the Roman military machine during the fourth century. That, contrarily wise to basically like I think 90% of people have ever heard of was not only as good as the, the, the early Roman imperial force, it actually was more than that, it was better than that and uh, a few people reject this because they, they, they throw in the idea that fundamentally oh uh, yeah, uh, it basically changed um, it, it, it was not better or worse because it simply adapted to the situation, but yeah, it was kind of, it, it was not like the first one. Uh, Wu says this thing generally doesn't understand much, nor about the 4th century Roman army, but about, I would say, the Roman military and uh, military history in general, because any person who has studied the 4th century Roman army, the Constantinian army, perfectly knows that the defensive and offensive capabilities of the, fort, uh, of the Roman legion by this time were superior than the one that had ever preceded them. And uh, nobody cares about whether you like uh, so much uh, what you know the Roman military was before. Uh, here we talk about real military history, so um, that has no room um, in, in, in this context. And um, I, uh, I I care very much about this because I, I like to be to be objective and I don't I don't care fundamentally whether this was the late Roman army or the early Roman army and I'm not ad, you know uh, aligned with some ideology or I need to say this to, to make kind of a shock effect about things it, it's simply as it is and it just takes to look in fact battles like this and the enemies that the Romans were fighting and and realized that. This is objectively uh, the point. Uh, so this is a bit of like of a background. Uh, actually, today we will probably not uh, insist too much on, on this point, but um, it, it's important to bear it in mind and just to frame this battle in general uh, within this uh, optic, uh, let's say. And um, the 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 idea of Ju about Julian is that you know he ruled for for a relatively few time to tell whether he was this great figure. In fact, there is a lot of BS in this sense as well. You know, many people uh, like or dislike him just because of religious matters, as if you know that was the most important thing uh, or a criterion that we can employ like uh, seventeen hundred years uh, later, uh, just on base of our you know of our subjective. Uh, perspective. But um, 
the point is that he ruled too few to know whether what what he would have become, right? Now, talking about his um, commanding capabilities, however, uh, we uh, can assess that he was a, a, a substantial, at, at, at least a good command, right? At least, right? He uh, because although he had little practical experience in military affairs. Um, Ammianus tells us that uh, Julian taught himself military tactics through the study of certain books, and so he would likely have been aware of much of Roman martial knowledge. And um, when uh, Ammianus wrote after Julian's death, and adding that uh, he had um, uh, that Julian had a, a great fortitude in military matters, right? He showed that uh, indeed in this uh, great number of battles that he fought and the way he conducted uh, the campaigns as well as his ability to endure extreme uh, weather conditions, his ability in, in the fight itself and uh, being unafraid to engage the enemy directly on the battlefield. Naturally, Amianus writes uh, for, you know, he's, he's always considered kind of a part of the same Julian's propaganda. Sometimes even the text we will read today shows that but aside from the fact that every uh, every single uh, work of the time was propaganda especially at, at this levels um, of historiography um, there is no doubt that there are many notable examples of of Julian demonstrating his knowledge in military matters in sieges of cities and fortresses undertaken and amidst the most extreme dangers um, and th there is this also this tactical awareness, probably uh, s stemming from Saint Julian, in that he arranged his battle lines um, in, in in different fashion uh, every time he chose uh, his safe and celebrous place to to to, to encamp. And also, he wisely planned also minor aspects, but equally probably very important ones at the same time, like planning posting of frontier guards and field uh, pickets, uh, etc. Uh, another figure we will encounter today uh, in the Ro among the Roman commanders of Julian's army is uh, is Severus, right? He was mag Magister Equitum, so the cavalry commander. Uh, we don't know a big deal about him. He was an experienced and able commander that was dispatched to go by the, the emperor to replace the dismissed Magister Equitum Marcellus, right hand. Um, he um, he immediately uh, came in, in, in synchrony with, with Julian, and um, Amianus defines him as a man neither subordinate nor overbearing, but well known for his long and excellent record in the army. And he probably participated in the proposal of, propo of the idea of attacking the Alamanni uh, at Strasbourg, where in, in, in the battle which uh, he skillfully executed Julian's orders commanding the left wing of the army uh, basically setting off uh, um, uh, an ambush uh, prepared by the Germanic uh, uh, commander Serapio that now we will see in a while and uh, eventually you know the the relations with Julian will will worsen over time but for now we were not concerned about this. And there are other minor figures, uh, certain officers, for example, that uh, were part of a of the Auxilia Palatina, that now we will see what they were, that were fundamentally um, same Celts or even Germans, like the Frankish tribune of the Cornuti by, by Nobaudus, right? The Cornuti were um, an Auxilia Pal uh, Palatina unit. Uh, who lost his life on the battlefield at Argentorado, right? And uh, during the campaign, he had distinguished himself in seizing several islands from from the Alamanni uh, along the Rhine, and uh, he he was an important figure worth mentioning. Looking at the Germanic side, uh, the Alamannic side, and their allies, but partly were even the Utungi and other populations are allies to, of the Alamanni. Um, we have this name of Knodomar mm -hmm. that is defined by Amianus as the, the man who had caused the universal turmoil and confusion 
um, in, by invading uh, Roman Gaul, so crossing the Rhine, and uh, he was basically the, the major responsible, uh, the, main, the, the leader who pushed the most for uh, the invasion. And aside from this campaign, uh, we find very little mention for Knodemar, which is normal because the, the Germanic chieftains, you know, they, they came and, and went. You know, it's not that they they left uh, an incredibly significant uh, mark. Also, because they uh, th these societies were extremely fluid in many ways from a political point of view. So uh, there were many other chieftains, and Knodemar was the the most uh, authoritative, the, the one that you know, the most influent. However, that uh, was practically in command of this uh, army of Alamanni. And he is described uh, by Libanius as of considerable height and strength and nicknamed, um, and also by Amianus telling the truth, but he was nicknamed by, uh, the, by uh, Libanius as the, the giant. Mm -hmm. um, and in AD uh, 350, Knodomar uh, had been encouraged by the Roman Emperor Constantius II, who uh, we remembered before was engaged in the East against the Sassanids to attack uh, Roman Gaul in order to engage the usurper Magnensis, who had turned against Constantius' brother, the Emperor Constantius I, and killed him. So the Alemannic kings entered Roman territory and defeated the Roman army commanded by the census brother of Magnensis and his Caesar. And after this, this victory, Knodomar was able to freely loot Gaul, right? So, uh, and in, in in the campaign of 357 that we're seeing now, Knodemar had succeeded in inflicting a resounding defeat on Barbatia, was this other Roman commander who was uh, operating actually in, in Gaul together with Julian, that at this point instead um, uh, retired to winter quarters prema prematurely, so prematurely, sorry, and uh, leaving Julian alone against a superior force. And, um, and, and that's, uh, it's, it's Canon de Mars that decides at this point to challenge Julian in open field outside Argentorado. Hmm. Uh, there is some, some debate relatively to this saying, you know, whether um, by the same sources, whether the Germans were really searching for the fight or not, uh, because of this idea that they were uh, the Germans were not very eager to meet the Romans in open field, usually, but this is a bit of a cliché, and uh, it's uh, it's repeated by the sources who like to stress uh, this sharp differences between the Romans and, and the Germans, right? But as many other uh, ones, they, they were much lower than it seems, and actually all the, the behavior that now we can't see of, um, of the Alemanni during the campaign was aimed fundamentally at uh, at least in this case, when the, the, they they crossed the Rhine, it was to meet uh, the, the Romans in open field, and in practically um, that was very important because having defeated Barbatia that was out of the way. Um, if if the Germans had defeated uh, Julian's army, they, they would have had uh, the gates of Gaul uh, opened. So they were there uh, to to meet Julian in open field, and they weren't uh, running away. Um, and these are matters that are, you know, uh, uh, I believe it's it's ex excessive to, to talk of a um, of a standard tendency of uh, of delaying the fight or you know avoiding fight openly. And uh, there is a passage here uh, from Zosimus that I can't read. You says Caesar that is talking about Julian um, was at this time unable to restrain the nocturnal, it, it basically is talking about the, um, you know, the problems that, that had been present to, to meet other um, Germanic units that were swarming around, because here the, the concept is that there was a nucleus of, of Germanic forces, but the rest were, you know, uh, without much of a control, right, so they used this kind of guerrilla tactics to, uh, to, to raid uh, the Roman territory and to avoid confrontation, but because there were smaller parties, right, but they were equally difficult to cope with, because the Roman army was fundamentally preferably about, in fact, pitch battles, and that's where they had, in fact, usually, um, you know, um, not necessarily an advantage uh, all the time, but obviously they, they were favored by 
collective training and, and discipline and, and equipment and, and that's where at this time uh, the, the Roman army was still extremely effective it, it would basically always remain as such that there is this myth that it basically the quality declined is doesn't take into account that this statement is based exclusively on the fact that uh, what we see later on is, is not properly the Roman army. You know, when you start talking about the Federati, we're talking about different peoples that are not Roman. They do not have a Roman training. They might have had experience in the Roman army and stuff like that, but they don't have a Roman state that is n capable of giving that discipline, that collective training. So as long as the Ro there was an empire, there was an uh, the, the most effective military out there, and so this concept of the decline is uh, doesn't make sense ex essentially because of this reason, right? So here, just keeping to quote Zosimus, Caesar was uh, at this time unable to restrain the nocturnal and clandestine incursions of the barbarians as they robbed his small parties struggling for, uh, from each other, and when they appeared, not one of them was visible. Julian therefore accepted the services of uh, Carietto, an irregular Frankish warrior who had chosen to fight for the empire. His irregular methods included nighttime infiltration by small groups into wooded areas under Kamavi control, terror and intimidation raids, and the systematic decapitation of any captured enemy warriors. Carietto's methods were li highly effective, and Julian added to them many of the Sali against the plundering Kamavi, who, though they lived on what they stole, yet uh, were probably less expert in the art of robbing than these men who had studied it. In the day he guarded the open fields and killed all that escaped his robbers. Right. So this is interesting because it shows that the Romans were able to cope with this strategy simply by employing other um, barbarians. Right. And this is very important because it tells you the story of a multi-secular um, integration of this uh, Germanic elements into the Roman army that we tend to, to highlight mostly in this later period but had existed ever since basically the Romans had entered in contact with the Germans in the first place um, and it was a common practice with any other population that the Romans encountered so this has uh, you know we, we could expand this but maybe maybe it's not necessary looking at the rest of the Germanic commanders we can mention um, Serapio that we, uh, we we named before actually, under which the, was posed the right wing of the Alemannic army at Argentorat, right? Uh, and Serapio was Knodomar's nephew, um, defined um, as uh, Amianus writes, still a young man with downy cheeks, um, that it would have been uh, called uh, again. Uh, Agenaricus, uh, so th that would be the, the original Germanic name, if his father Medericus had not initiated him into certain Greek mysteries. This had happened in Gaul. This also tells you how you know exposed the same Germans were to this uh, broader uh, Hellenistic world that that, that the, the Roman uh, Empire had turned into, and uh, so that they would even call changed their name into, into a Greek one, <laughs> being Germans, you know, that, that, and, and believing in the, the Greek mysteries and stuff like that. So it's pretty interesting. Um, and Amianus, uh, maybe we'll expand it a bit uh, more into this uh, later in terms of the composition of the Germanic army. He talks about um, this uh, other elements um, that, uh, you know, it included mercenaries, parts of warriors under the command of their rulers, uh, that contained five kings, reges in Latin, uh, whose names were Vestralpus, that was basically the second most important figure after Knodomar, then Urius, uh, Ursicinus, Suomarius, and Ortarius. Then uh, this army included other, uh, th this lower aristocracies, like the original princes called Regales, um, and this great amount of noblemen known as the Optimates. And so these are naturally all Latin words that were used by I Roman uh, I historiography to, to define the, the social segmentation of the of the Germans. And um, so with the exception of Serapio, uh, the other kings um, were treated like lieutenants in Gnodomar's arm and were subordinate to him. 
and we virtually know nothing about them, uh, if not for the fact that they were compelled that their own men to dismount before battle, as we've seen now. So th there is this that that's a very interesting passage to will read and explain better. Um, and this tells a lot about uh, those worlds. Uh, let's talk now instead about the size and composition of the respective armies. So starting from the Romans, uh, Ammianus um, tells us that Roman forces were significantly outnumbered going into battle against the Alaman, right? There is some big doubt about this, um, uh, considering what you know, realistic estimates of what th these numbers could be. Um, the the impression that we we get here, uh, especially in according to, to 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 drink water, that is one of the most uh, w one of the scholars who studied this better, is that fundamentally the Roman and the Alemannic army uh, were were very similar numerically speaking. Um, uh, it's possible that the Romans were even more than the Alemanni spite of what Amianus says, but the I think the, it could also be the way the other way around telling the truth. But probably they weren't that different in, in number, right? Uh, there is this general consensus that um, the Romans numbered something like thirteen thousand troops. And uh, Drinkwater estimated this between thirteen thousand in fact and fifteen thousand. And um, this is um, derived fundamentally from Ammianus records. Uh, Ammianus was involved, uh, he was a military man himself, he was involved in the organizational administration of the army, right? So he ha also had access to troop records uh, of the time. And um, the, the Roman army at this point was, was a pretty uh, advanced, sophisticated military machine uh, in terms of discipline, armament, organization, and strategy definitely Julian's army w had solid quality that the the Alemanni lacked right the, uh, we'll, we'll see this now better what what the 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 strong um, features of, of the Alemannic forces were right but uh, what really makes the difference in war is most like the, the, the broader organization right and, and not much of the indi single individual value but much of the as we said before, the collective train and all. So the Roman army was legitimately feared by the Germans, and as we said before, there was this general tendency of avoiding contact with, uh, with uh, avoiding pitched battles against the Romans from the side of the Germans, especially if their objective was merely to, to, to pillage and raid across the Rhine or across the Danube, as it was, um, yeah, as it had started since since ever we can say intensifying from the second half of the first uh, of the second century AD uh, and and particularly increasing during the third and the fourth century Th this campaign was very different as we have seen and that's where he, he arrived to a pitch battle because the Alemanni wanted to get rid of the Roman army so they felt um, uh, confident enough to to meet it uh, in open ground uh, coming to the Roman uh, composition uh, we know of 360 guardsmen that that accompanied uh, the Caesar Julian into Gaul. Uh, these units, are given by Amianus, are the Equites Scutari and the Equites Gentiles. The greatest numbers were provided by these other types of troops instead, that were the um, the the, uh, the experienced auxiliary units that fought alongside. Uh, each other and the Roman legions proper, mm. and these were the, the feared auxilia palatina, and these were of uh, in in this region, uh, in Gaul, of essentially of Germanic and Celtic origin. We'll see that there were units that came from all over all over the empire, probably um, even in in this battle. But it's important because the, the palatine units here were. Um, Basically, the most important of 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 the Roman forces, like the, the Constantinian ar uh, reform, had brought to the, the establishment of uh, ex a classification, actually, of three uh, different types of troops. The ultra elite were the the scole palatine, that were essentially the the personal guard of the emperor, right? Uh, that had followed the, the Praetorian guard uh, after its disbandment, operated by Constantine. Uh, traditionally, 200, 
12, but even, even there the, the history is a bit more complicated. Then came properly the uh, the mobile army known as the Comitatus that was in turn divided into the following uh, subunits that were differentiated between them by a hierarchical rank and the first ones in fact were the uh, palatine uh, units so th this were the, the palaces uh, troops also known as with the adjective presentalis presentalis probably that uh, they represented the, the elite of the Roman army and they uh, were part of the army under the direct control of the emperor uh, and uh, they were subdivided in fact in Palatine legions, the legiones palatine, so, um, uh, so the, the largely heavy infantry of the mobile army of the uh, of the Palatine or Presentalis army, then the Auxilia Palatina, so this mix of troops, but fundamentally it's not much of a tactical differentiation, meaning that these were fundamentally varying, especially the Auxilia that tended to, to fight still in their traditional ethnic um, um, fashion. Um, and the Vexillaciones Palatine, that is instead the, the cavalry of the mobile uh, presentalis army. Then there were, uh, so talking about the, the Auxilia Palatina, uh, then there were of course the, the Comitatensis units, the, the Pseudo Comitatensis units, and uh, etc. So, but now going down the ranks, we also don't know who was there in the battle, right? But uh, these units, however, are pretty clear that they had a, I mean, the Auxilia Palatina, they had a pretty important role in the battle, as we will see. And uh, they were considered, in fact, very highly, right? Uh, their names uh, in here at Strasbourg were uh, the uh, Celte, the Petulantes, the Cornuti, the Bracchiati, and the Reges. Mm -hmm. And then the Eruli and the Batavi, right? So this board name, as you understand, even of certain ethnic groups, mm -hmm. for example, the Batavi were. Uh, the Batavians essentially were not a single unit of cavalry um, as they, for example, they were mentioned by Amianus together with the other auxilia, uh, the, the, the Regi, the Batavi and uh, other uh, other Regibus actually if I quote correctly um, and there is no mention of action from a reserve cavalry unit from which now we'll, we'll see also about we'll see it is better from the array and the development of the battle so we think that they were mostly infantry, right? So these auxiliary units, uh, individually, the ones we have listed were uh, roughly 500 strong, so they were kind of a of a regiment, right? And they were um, they would be particularly effective uh, in this battle, and uh, uh, were were practically not different from the uh, from the heavily armed and armored Roman legionnaires proper, right? That there was a lot of uh, hybriding um, in, in here, right? The the concept is that uh, the the auxilia could be as effective and as well equipped as the same Roman legionnaires, right? And this is not uh, valid just for this fourth century. It's, it's contrary to, to what common you know perception the the Roman army is. That this happened also before, uh, and. Uh, it's useless to be dogmatic about the, the contrary, um, and the, uh, the, the there is some debate uh, about these other units, the, the Regi, especially because um, they uh, the, they might have been uh, coming from from outside of Gaul, right? Actually, coming from uh, there the might have been a Judean unit even think about it, there was stationed in Alexandria of Egypt that might have been shipped to Gaul in the February of 356 AD. Uh, this is at least one interpretation that we have, but because sometimes we, we have a list of these units, there, there is the Notitia de Unitatum, etc., but there were many others that we can't keep track of, also because units are something of the most mobile and, um, you know, ever-changing uh, over time. That you can't find. I mean, the, the units are not saying they could be mixed, they, they, they could be blended and detached. They, they, that's how the Roman army was at the time, and partially also before. So it's difficult to, to keep track of all of these units. 
at once. We're, we're already lucky enough to, to know what we know about them. It's it's already great. Um, the among the legions, uh, the uh, that numbered this time between five hundred and one thousand men, the place of honor was held by the primani. The primani uh, were a Palatine legion that Constantine had already integrated into the mobile army. Uh, also regarding to this unit there is a bit of a debate, we don't know whether they were uh, a vexillatio of the old uh, legio uh, prima italica or uh, they, they were uh, maybe uh, from the legio prima Iulia. Um, there are other hypotheses uh, also deriving from, from more recent uh, units, but um, it, it's, it, it leads to some sort of speculation. Maybe at this point it's not even very important. Um, uh, Ammianus also mentions the Mesiaci, so this unit originally bearing the name of, of the province of Mesia on the lower Danube. Um, just a word that meaning that these units were usually named after the region that they were recruited originally from. Uh, but this doesn't mean that they were actually uh, over time ethnically composed by people who came from those places, right? You know, the, the, the name remained, but uh, the soldiers changed, could be integrated with other uh, troops. So um, the, 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 the Roman army at this point was very, very hev heavily mixed in this sense. So uh, uh, naturally with the units stationing in the uh, the, the mobile army of, this, uh, of local religions of Gaul, most of them would have been of Gallo-Roman origin essentially also of Germanic origins as we've seen, but there were elements coming also a bit from everywhere. Then there is this other unit, uh, this other uh, legion actually, the, the Joviani and the, the Herculiani as well, um, that uh, albeit not mentioned in the sources were already uh, in the Comitatus of Magnentius and uh, were therefore inherited by, by Julian when he, he took over. And there are other suggestions uh, about uh, units that could have been present in Julian's army in this uh, this campaign. For example, the Armigeri Defensores and the Martenses, and um, and maybe of the Legio Prima Flavia Pacis. Uh, we know that there were, uh, I, I think, surely some units of the Legio Prima Marcia, uh, because this this. Uh, legions could also be uh, split, like in subunits could be detached somewhere else, right? Um, and we know this, in fact, uh, because their camp actually was uh, attacked by the Alamanni in 354 AD, and the survivors were incorporated into Julian's army, right? That, that's the point. Um, the the army of uh, the Roman army, at the Battle of Strasbourg, also included some. Uh, ballistari Daphnenses. Mm -hmm. The Ballistari were sort of crossbowmen, practically. Uh, I don't know whether the name comes. From, uh, I, I don't think we don't know whether it comes from the, the the catapults that they they employed, or or also the the actual the actual cro mm, crossbows that were used in the late Roman army, not as powerful as the medieval ones, will become. Uh, many centuries afterwards, but still, you know, uh, effective. Uh, and we know this because Amianus writes that this unit escorted uh, Julian from uh, the city of Vienne to Auxerre, mm, alongside the Clibanari that now we will take a look at, uh, of the, the heaviest cavalry, basically. Um, uh, other scholars point out that the presence of other Maybe another legion, the, the Tungrecani one. Um, the um, that could have been mm, maybe mistaken for auxiliaries. Uh, I mean, uh, here maybe I, it's too complicated to explain, or I simply don't understand it, fr <laughs> frankly. Uh, that, however, might have been under the left wing. Uh, under Severus on the left wing, as we will see now with, with the battle array. Um, lastly, cavalry. Mm -hmm. 
the Battle of Strasbourg is one of those examples in which we will see how the Roman um, cataphracts, you know, so the, this uh, basically emulation of Eastern heavy cavalry uh, of the heaviest heavy cavalry uh, of the heaviest cavalry in the East. Uh, didn't turn out very well for the Romans. The, the Romans during the late Roman Empire made a pretty mediocre, if not very poor, actually very disastrous most of the times, use of cataphracts and it didn't turn out well for them. Uh, this time always remembered cavalry had increased in importance but infantry is always the, 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 it's most, it's, it's the size of arm, right? And the, the Roman cavalry at, at the Battle of Strasbourg was composed by uh, the vexillationes of the equites sagittari, that is the horse archers, uh, they were particularly dreaded by the Germans, the clibanari, mm, that were basically fully armored cataphracts, as far as we can tell from the terminology, and the equites cataphractari, especially two vexillationes specifically. So the, this would have been uh, a partially armored cavalry, right? And probably there might have been other three elite vexillationes of the um, uh, light equites dalmati, who had been uh, integrated into Magnentius Comitatus, and therefore Julian uh, would have inherited uh, at this point. Uh, and in total, Julian's army comprised, uh, therefore, five legions, detachments from perhaps other five legions, seven auxilia palatina and other auxiliary units, and seven cavalry units, right? So it's very composite uh, picture, but you know, um, when you look at this, this, this composition, it was not so messy as, uh, as it looks. I mean, it, it was it, but in, in other epochs it was uh, exactly the same. You know, if we have the sense that that by this time, Roman army was kind of more disordered or uh, more heterogeneous. So, but the you know the units work the, the way they do, and these were paradoxically, even if they came from different populations, they were pretty homogeneous uh, military, right? They were trained in a quite uh, uh, effective way, and uh, they they all responded to, to certain high standards of quality that. Um, that knew, by the way, how to, to cooperate uh, with each other pretty well. So, d depending on the, the, their tactical specializations, they, they knew at uh, this time how to maximize the effects on the field. Naturally, leadership is fundamental uh, in, in the process, but uh, it, there is already a strong base, a structural base in the Roman army as, as it came out of the, the training uh, in itself. Um, looking at the Alamanni instead, their force. So this is a bit more complicated to reconstruct because um, uh, Ger Germanic troops would be much more homogeneous even than the Roman ones and uh, and it's often very difficult to distinguish what numbers mean not just because the source might simply um, uh, you know exaggerate maybe especially in this case uh, saying that the, the Germans were so many the Romans were so few this is a bit of a of a literary topos among others we'll see today. Uh, Amianus, as we said before, talks about 30,000 warriors, right? And it, it's somewhat uh, difficult to believe. And uh, modern scholars uh, accepted sometimes even very low uh, estimates of between 6,000 and 10,000 Alamanni, so even less than the Romans. But uh, Drinkwater proposes uh, roughly 15,000 men, right? So um, there's no way to, to know this, right? Considering this would have been Alamanni plus other uh, allies and so on. So um, the, 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 the Roman sources I will see uh, after the battle would count uh, six, between six to eight thousand Alamannic uh, kills, right? So, um, I mean, uh, Alamannic losses fundamentally. So this is consistent with us with a number that could be, yeah, like 15,000. Mm -hmm. uh, basically nobody believes <laughs> uh, Amianus, except actually certain uh, others such as Elton and Heed, uh, who argue that the 35,000 
armati because this is the term that um, Amianus uses. So it means armed men, right? So he's, he's talking about fighting force. Uh, might actually have been something different. That is, uh, which is typical for the Germanic peoples, uh, especially at this time, we're often on the move in a kind of semi-nomadic fashion, to bring a lot of civilians together with them. Uh, it's not that they were excessively desperate at this point, like the Goths will be while well, pressed by the Huns later on. But uh, it would be normal for these populations to 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 work like of a as broader. Uh, society that cooperates to also with uh, for in this sense for this military uh, goal at the end of the day um, so we could extend it this we, we know that, uh, that, that it exists at probably some sort of uh, a standard uh, unit of I mean not standard but you know a reasonable kind of company or regiment unit size between 200 600 uh, in terms of uh, you know who could be under same chieftain of some sort but this is partly speculative in my opinion um, it's been estimated what I find more interesting is the the general estimate of the Alemannic population of the time in total you know that Alemannia w would be uh, today's southwestern Germany in parts of uh, um, because eventually the, the Alemanni will expand into, into Roman territory. This time they were mostly into the so-called Agri Decumates, that would be today's Baden-Württemberg, essentially, and parts of maybe of northern Switzerland, and a tiny part of Alsace. Uh, and they were they had been settled there, right? They, they, those were Roman territories that, that, that the Alemanni were granted to, to settle in, uh, but basically seizing it on their own. And at this time, were roughly the total population. I mean, one hundred twenty thousand to one hundred fifty thousand people, right? So, um, it, it for such highly militarized societies like the German ones of this time, we we can't think of a um, of like a maximum of one fourth of um, of the of the population in arms, right? At, at the war, probably. The average would be much less, like in fact, one, probably one tenth, which is consistent with the fifty thousand, in fact, that we have given today. Uh, and consider that Roman Gaul at this time has ten million inhabitants, right? And this this proportion is is due to the fact that the Alemanni are, uh, have a very high military average. That they're a militarized society, like most of this. Uh, uh, Germanic tribes is living in a world where war is necessary uh, to, to survive. The, the goal was uh, socially stratified with now with a latifundium of a highly um, uh, disarmed population. There were certain areas um, where the Bagaudi would rise, for example, that were superficially Romanized, but overall they weren't a warlike society anymore. Um, so yeah, I, I would go for for, for fifteen thousand, but we, we could as a fighting force. But it wouldn't be so strange after all. The thir the thirty five thousand that Amianus talks about could could consist of you know other uh, say civilians if we can draw this distinction in a Germanic society as well, right? Um, so field aides and other 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 raiders because consider that this. Uh, that these invasions would would be a kind of a broader raiding party. You know, people would come from 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 everywhere to participate. It always it had always been like that. Um, and talking a bit more in the looking at the the organization of the Alemannic army, we could talk about the the Pagi, for example, that were the villages uh, that is we can think of broader districts actually. Where the uh, Germans had settled, um, as sedentarily speaking, um, that could form altogether this so-called regna. So these are all Latin terms, of course. So the pagi the, the, is the same word from which uh, the pagan comes from, because the pagi were in fact rural centers. There were villages. That's basically all what could be built across the Rhine. Just villages. They didn't have the, the resources and then technology to, to build more than that fundamentally um, and uh, the 
because the environment simply wouldn't support it. And uh, this Pudgy would build, would make up the Arena, that is the kingdoms, right? It probably were um, hereditary in part, uh, at least local, uh, the, 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 the lowest aristocracy would, would have this continuity. And, um, and Amianus gives us this hierarchy in which you find uh, Alemannic rulers described in various terms from uh, the most important to the least important. Uh, at the top you have the Reges Excelsiores Ante Alios, right? So this means the, the kings that are, uh, that excel over all the others, right? Uh, that would be Nodomar and Vestralpus as they, they're defined. And uh, then the Reges Proximi, so kind of local kings that also would have some consistent importance. Then the Reguli, so the, the lesser kings, the diminutive in Latin. The regales, so those were not regis, but they are kind of like that, you know. So that we could term them as princes. And um, this hierarchy was naturally, as we were saying, very fluid, meaning that these societies were not excessively stratified, and um, certain aristocracies would rise and fall pretty easily, right? But obviously, there was a uh, these were clientry societies. Those uh, they depended on each other and. The, the Alemannic Confederation in particular was famous because it was particularly cohesive in terms of, mm, let's say, national cohesion, which, which is what really made the difference, uh, from a, even from a military point of view. Like, we don't have to think that these peoples fundamentally differ too much, militarily speaking. I mean, you can't say, yeah, the kind of the Eastern Germans, they, they had kind of more cavalry because they were more out there in the East in the step to contact with the Sarmatians and others. But fundamentally, if you look at them, uh, they, they were essentially the same thing. And, and what truly made the difference was this social balance, this political balance, even the wealth of the, these classes, wealth distribution. Uh, and the Alemanni, um, such as the Franks, so these Western uh, Germanic confederations, had mm, pretty, th th they were mm, realistically less stratified than others, especially of the Eastern Germans. And they uh, they bore these confederative uh, names that actually stressed this sort of equality, because Frank m means free, and Alemanni means uh, all the men. So stressing the fact that these were properly confederations. In fact, we talk about the Alemanni, but we have to think that all of these smaller kingdoms that that built uh, the confederation actually. Uh, had kept having their own names, right? The, the, these were all the tribes that had existed in Germany before, and the Alemanni was just the international name that they used, in fact, as a, you know, as a, uh, as international flag, right? And and so it's a pretty standard, um, uh, even meaningless name in in uh, at at a lower social, uh, pol political and social level because uh, every King would have dealt with his own affairs on, on his own, right? And they cared very much about their freedom, their individual freedom. And we'll see in the battle how what would happen, in fact, uh, of the, the, the all the various what the, the Germanic warriors start doing against their their chiefs uh, at one point to, to stress this uh, 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 autonomy. And and um, eventually there were other figures like the uh, optimates, so the the, the noblemen aristocrats of some sort, and uh, the, the warriors are called by the so r Roman sources like the Archmati uh, instead, that uh, that in turn were segmented definitely at this point between uh, kind of more professional troops like mercenaries, part of which had basically fought uh, very often within the same Roman army, or and or that had um, spent their life essentially as just as warriors uh, in the comitatus, right? With, uh, while they would be cited by the uh, the pages levy that were peasants, maybe were too, that were free men, and that they, they were even armed in fact, but they wouldn't join the, the military life and simply leave of, of their land, which was considered somewhat um, 
dishonoring for, for, from a German that had to be essentially a warrior, right? But reality was was different. Was this this subdivision? So uh, we could skip other consideration in part because it's not that we know that more uh, about these peoples, and I would say we we can pass to to the battle array of 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 uh, the battle of Strasbourg, which is very very interesting. Um, so according to some authors, Clonomar had created his alliance. Um, as a sort of defensive action to counter Julian's aggression, right? But this is probably false because uh, then why all this uh, willingness to, to, to attack the Romans, to meet the Romans, you know, in, in a pitched battle in the first place? So uh, there, there is this very aggressive intent in, in this battle, in this campaign in general that has been highlighted, right? And obviously all of these entities would claim some sort of, uh, uh, they would try to justify their intention, this is pretty normal. And um, the, uh, we, we, we probably, um, we, we, we underlined before how this strategic attitude uh, goes even against what was the standard uh, Germanic attitude uh, that was to, to avoid, if, if possible, a pitch battle against the Roman army, right? You said here you, you find this quite determined uh, 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 intention to, to destroy what was left of the Roman forces in Gaul so they could seize this uh, very wealthy province and extend their power. And that's why this battle is so important, also strategically point of view, because Julian effectively halted the, 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 the Alemannic invasion that threatened to, to conquer uh, large parts of Gaul. And uh, that was an overwhelmingly richer land than Germany. So that's why obviously these people wanted to, to, to set there and that's how it would happen eventually in the 5th century. And um, um, the Alemanni were an important confederation, as we've seen. They were able to call, um, to assemble other, uh, other tribes uh, to, to join the, their, their invasion of Gaul, right? And uh, they they were also well organized. Uh, Gnodomar uh, himself uh, sent messengers to the other Germanic leaders, and um, he is described by Amianus as having this very pre-existing king-like status over the Alamanni, right? Which is which is plausible because um, he was already, uh, as we've seen, he was already. Uh, uh, scoped essentially by Constantius um, as as a point of reference among this this, this confederation could that could send against Magnensis, right? So um, this happened that there were certain leaders that emerged from this fairly uh, you know uh, egalitarian background also because there was this necessity uh, chiefly for military reasons. Like this is what the Germans did usually is that theoretically uh, leaders of the world people were had to be uh, elected just in, in case of war, because in, uh, uh, in in peace there was no reason to have someone who commanded others. While in war, yes, right. So naturally, these these peoples were very different from the kind of the primitive Germans of the time of Augustus that fought with, you know, I don't know, with clubs. You know, that we will see how um, the Alemannic tactics at this point had uh, underwent a a, a massive amount of romanization for for germanic standards and that's what made them also so damn uh, feared because uh, they were at this point easily the uh, the greatest threat in the west is in terms of military of military quality and of, of, of political power in, in general so um, definitely uh, uh, the there is all a political background in here in the relation between uh, Julian and Constantius II, but we, we skip this. Now, for what uh, concerns the battle now, let, let's take a look at how um, how Knodemar acted, given that he had the, the initiative in this sense. Um, 
and uh, the Germans uh, at this time let's consider the fact that they were well prepared I mean the, 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 it was the idea of attacking uh, Gaul was not just Knodemars like all the other chieftains had pushed for it right and, and therefore they had uh, organized accordingly and they wanted an open battle with the Romans um, and, and and the fact that they also crossed the Rhine is very meaningful because uh, fighting also with, with the river in their back it was a, a risk and in fact they will pay that dearly uh, with the defeat uh, after the defeat and, um, and 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 therefore and there probably was a uh, also a greater push from the rest of the of the popula of the Dalmanic population right it, that was I will as we will see in the battle eager to, to, to meet the enemy like they they showed this commitment it probably also part of their aristocracy um, you know uh, it's not that it, it, it wouldn't want because we have seen it, it was a shared consensus but you know it, this was a a communitary choice it was more than the usual uh, rate this was really an invasion it was felt by the Alemanni as a as a needed thing the Alemanni always remember I made a video on the Alemanni probably should remake another one uh, but they had uh, even if you look at their f future history they uh, albeit um, at one point that they were Roman Federati they they also sought uh, Rome's help on some occasion they were betrayed, for example, by Caracalla in the third century that also defeated them and massacred a whole lot of them. So that they always had a kind of an anti-Roman uh, siding, right? And not much because they were more or less resistant to Romanization than other Germans. Um, that we know, for example, when they settled in the Agri de Cumatis, we see it from their tombs, especially their women, began imme immediately to, 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 to dress in, in the Roman fashion. Uh, these are kind of interesting things. Um, but uh, let's say they, they always, because of their uh, of the international situation, they always remain kind of the enemies of Rome, right? They also refused Christianization up to very late, like in the eighth century. Uh, this sense is also uh, very interesting to study because remaining pagan for a longer time, they, they kept burying their dead with their weapons. So we, we got archaeologically um, more stuff uh, from them, but these are fr from later times. And um, so the, the, they're a bit, uh, the, they're actually enemies of the empire uh, on the western frontier and, uh, and a hell of a power, right, that only the Franks eventually will manage to, to subdue, right, when they would have settled in, in Gaul uh, themselves. And uh, looking at the Germanic battle array at the Battle of Strasbourg, right, um, so well, we, we don't know cent for cent where the battle took place, but we, we can roughly identify an area that is this uh, in the not very far from the walls of Strasbourg of Argentoratum at the time. Uh, the battlefield com ha was characterized by this slightly sloping hill, um, several kilometers from the Rhine, right? So a long way to eventually. Uh, run back to, to the Rhine and eventually trying to cross it. Um, and this area is probably located near the village of uh, Oberhausbergen, that is five kilometers northwest of Strasbourg today. Um, and that's where the Romans met with the Alemanni. Uh, they had their first visual contact and where in fact the bulk of the uh, the Alemanni was located given that we've seen that it was plenty of other uh, raiding po uh, like other units scattered around and that went that probably escaped the same control of their their chieftains because they weren't there on their own maybe they were just uh, they had just joined the Alemanni and were gravitating simply around the, their their army um, and um, th this battlefield is quite interesting uh, as we'll see now, the, the basically the Lamani were advancing in the wedge formation uh, with uh, the cavalry con concentrated on the left wing, where Knodemar himself uh, was and easily recognizable as Amianus Price because he was like two meters tall, uh, obese and uh, enormous in this sense, and he had a flame colored tuft of hair on his helmet and also he had very expansive weaponry like it was typical for for the 
the ultra aristocracy uh, at this time. And initially, um, I mean, the, the, the Alemanni had taken ground on the top of a rise, and um, they th there was a good position, uh, also good for an eventual defensive, but they, they, they would advance in the battlefield, as we will see now. And um, the, the Germanic uh, army w was deployed actually very simply, like it would be also logical for, for an army of this kind of composition. The troops were quite homogeneous and most of them were deployed in the center. Um, the, the Germans uh, were deployed uh, together in units uh, based on the on the Pagi. So these were troops that all kind of knew each other. They came from the same place. They uh, what the Germanic uh, uh, troops uh, lacked in, in discipline. They they tried to to compensate with this uh, with this idea of sense of belonging to. to to a community, to to a clan, right? So that's what truly really made their. Um, uh, obviously, this that wouldn't make them reach the same levels of discipline of the Romans. They, 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 they couldn't perform very complicated maneuvers, so they didn't have the collective training for that. But they surely had, especially from an individual point of view, a great courage, great motivation, and uh, it was a bit of. The, the, this warlike edus of the, the Germanic peoples that, that was fundamental in this tribal societies if, if for the same survival of society, right? Uh, so they cared about this very much, and this would be a sort of a uh, you know thick, massive uh, formation, right? Uh, what uh, we underestimate is is the the concentration of of uh, of infantry, especially mostly spearmen, into into uh, confined spaces, and their their strength, their resilience, right, and, and the motivation that these populations have. Um, on the left flank, Knodemar uh, uh, was positioned together with the other noblemen, and and here is where the bulk of the Germ of German uh, the Germanic cavalry was deployed, and the Germans did at this point. Uh, uh, an active attack that was used since uh, a long time, even Ariovistus back in the first century BC when uh, fighting against Caesar had used it, but was basically to intersperse light infantry uh, throughout the, the cavalry formation to essentially support the, uh, the cavalrymen during combat. Uh, the reason for this uh, was that the, the especially the Western Germans, such as the Alemanni, they didn't have quite of a great cavalry in general. I mean, the the individually such cavalry were, were pretty pretty good. Like the same Caesar back in the day had preferred to 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 give uh, uh, his uh, Roman equites horses to the Germanic uh, ho uh, horsemen that he he hired uh, in Gaul. Uh, the, because they were very, very, uh, very good individual fighters, and also would, would save the Romans from from defeat on on, on multiple occasions during the Gallic Wars. So, um, but um, so individually they were great, but they also the strategicon of Mauritius says this in the sixth century. They they didn't have great deal of order, right? Because um, Cavalry was very expansive. There were a few in society in general, and therefore there was a fewer chance to, to for this cavalry to fight all together in large numbers. They didn't have many resources to to train uh, repeatedly, so uh, their tactics would be uh, not a, not extremely effective. Uh, they would have troubles in charging all together, maintaining formation. They, they simply weren't trained enough for doing that. So. Uh, their tactics included probably skirmishing and surely also charging because that's what cavalry always can do. But obviously, with with in different uh, uh, potential, d d in different degree of strength, and light infantry has in this context the uh, the the idea of covering, of course, this cavalry uh, movements and also to to aggress uh, enemy cavalry. Right, given that um, this is a kind of uh, 
disorder formation of the role. It's like a globe of, of troops that go back and forth. Also, more ordered formations have trouble to kind of uh, charging specifically in one place. And uh, if they maybe charge and they don't meet anyone, then their impetus, their momentum is lost and they can be aggressed more easily by, by, by infantry. And you know that uh, cavalry is never as weak as after uh, a successful charge. So uh, that can do And we'll see that these tactics will be effective against Tanishuk, the heaviest type of cavalry that existed at the time, which was the one that the Romans were fielding there, the, the catafractari, and even uh, the, the heavier ones. Um, on the right wing, uh, instead, uh, the the Alamanni had a uh, some woods and in, in a in a in a stream, so that the, their right flank would, was covered, and it was used to um, to hide uh, into this this woods and ditches that they built in, in into them, uh, uh, contingent of infantry that had to lie ambushed to to the Roman left wing. Right, so basically they had shifted all the cavalry on on the left was kind of open ground, and on this closed ground on the right they they detached this ambush party, and this is a clever deployment. Like uh, the Germans, as you know, they were also pretty skilled in ambushing, uh, and this is a good combination that objectively was uh, was pretty sensed, given the information that we have, pretty logical. It kind of maximized the, the Germanic um, um, potential given given the situation. And uh, here um, uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the right flank the, the Germans would start uh, constructing some ditches to contain large numbers of warriors that would have had to, to spring up suddenly uh, during the clash and attack the, the, the Roman flank hopefully uh, making the the Roman formation, the, the Roman army f uh, fleeing uh, all together, and uh, the Romans uh, on their left actually had a, an aqueduct. At least this is what Libanius says: a wood, a cane thicket, and also a piece of moorland. So initially, they they were fairly well protected, and there was not much great deal of maneuvering that could occur in fact on, on the on the on their left right and um, and there is also another spicy detail about this that is that probably the the Germans were aware of the Roman battle plan because certain uh, I don't remember which source but it states uh, expressly that one of the of Barbatia's um, soldiers that had uh, that that would have that was condemned for some disciplinary um, uh, faults um, had fled the, the 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 camp the Roman camp and had uh, passed to the Germans and had informed them about the intentions of the Romans about Julian's battle plan and uh, probably the Germans knew uh, something about that. Talking about the Roman plan, in fact, um, it was fairly simple, yet not devoid of debate. Um, the Romans were evidently confident um, of in their their quality, in their morale. Right? They uh, they 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 knew that they could defeat these populations through their uh, arms and tactics in in a pitch battle. It was where they, they could finally meet them because, as we've seen them, it was very difficult to to find them in the first place. In fact, uh, the uh, Amianus says, "Quote: The Romans in this, as in former campaigns, thought that the hardest part of their work was done once the enemy was located." Right. So this is a bit of a uh, hyperbole, but it it's pretty m significant. Like it. Uh, the, the main problem was to find this enemy concentrated in one place. So it was, was a good uh, good occasion for for getting it over with, right? So um, this doesn't mean, of course, that the Romans were sure of victory, uh, because as we'll see, the battle would also prove you know pretty uh, pretty difficult. 
but it, it was kind of a great chance to to maximize the, the effects and um, yet also risking everything like in one shot so these are uh, uh, conditions that uh, are not met so so often that's why also the Battle of Strasbourg is so interesting because it provides uh, a relatively uh, rare example of a big pitch battle is also incidentally well documented between Romans and Germans in the fourth century of course there were others but um, so uh, the Romans had marched a long way like 34 kilometers to be on that battlefield so probably were not uh, very very fresh but uh, that can also steer morale right and uh, you know the marching army is active is dynamic has uh, you know exercised muscles is it's going there it's going to get it right so um, that that is also important and um, apparently the, the Alamanni as we've seen they had the advantage both in number and terrain and definitely their warriors were them brave fighters and um, uh, yet this take you know this speaks for the measure of Roman resolve like they were they were determined to meet them anyway in uh, Libanius funerary oration to Julian there is also uh, an interesting detail that um, maybe I forgot to mention is important that said that um, basically the Emperor I mean Caesar actually not the Emperor yet uh, had um, um, basically waited for enough Alamanni to have crossed the Rhine but not all of them right so that it, they could be enough to the, that in case of victory to to, to make a sense pretty crippling damage to, to, to the population as a well, but not as many as it could become impossible to defeat them. Vegetius uh, write uh, that, uh, that it would always be preferable to avoid battle when one's numbers are inferior to those of the enemy, right? But that's not something you can always do, you can't always afford, and you know, that's simple, you know, pretty theoretical and practically useless piece of information. Yeah, yeah okay, Thanks, my eyes, but it depends. Depends on many factors, and of course, there, there are other uh, battles in, that would occur even in a few decades that into which the Romans would engage uh, an overwhelmingly larger force of Germans and defeat them. But sometimes also the, na uh, the, the numbers are reliable. We don't we don't really know, right? But um, looking at the Roman order of battle, then instead I think it's particularly fascinating and uh, that also is important now for, for the battle as we're going to read it um, the um, basically uh, Julian uh, the, the Roman army was deployed in two lines right so Julian's army was um, composed by the auxilia palatina spread out on the wings right so the auxilia palatina had this very important task of protecting the, the, the flanks of the formation right while the legions were deployed in the center uh, this can be interpreted in the sense that the auxilia were fighting in a kind of more dynamic uh, uh, fighting uh, let's say um, fight combat style that did because of their ethnic origin let's say they were a bit more dynamic Roman legions were conceived uh, as kind of this 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 uh, steady uh, block of heavy infantrymen that uh, had you know probably the, the best use of course that they, they would tire relatively easy but uh, if they would move because they were heavier but as we've seen also the differences with the auxilia were not excessive yet probably this might have been the, the sense you know strong center and in fact is what were the the, the Alamanni would try uh, uh, to 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 break and they would break interestingly enough and but this troops deployed on two ranks right and two lines uh, widely spaced apart mm. um, this, this is important because it's like um, it, it increases the uh, the possibility of using reserves more effectively right so the, the uh, every line would be several rows deep which kind of makes a lot of sense because of the Alamanni charge that we will see 
what it was capable of doing. So they needed the Roman lines needed to absorb a very heavy uh, impact, very heavy charge, and the the spacing of the two lines was was important. So because you can't see more easily, you can you know having lines too close to each other can create lots of problems. Uh, first of all, uh, if if the first lines flee. Uh, they, they can create more confusion, right? So uh, spacing them is important. Also, you can see better what's going on in the distance um, without, you know, the mass, the dust that is being uh, rising into during combat, right? So uh, it kind of makes sense. It's important to to, to do, and uh, it, it doesn't mess up things excessively if one if the first line is broken. Um, in the center of the first Roman, uh, of the Roman first line, there were three of the five legions, including the army standard. This is an information that one of the few interesting informations we get from a Libanius uh, oration. This is the Oratio uh, 139, um, and in the center, um, two lines were arrayed with a wide space between them to extend across the full width of the the deployment in order to avoid encirclement, right? This is also um, particularly imp important uh, because uh, the, the, the Romans were worried about eventual flank attacks as well, so they were trying to, to, to extend the width but are still maintaining a decent uh, depth. So they basically spaced certain you know, so this could create, many people say, well, this would create a gap in the formation. Well, yes, but gaps are uh, also, you know, they mm, are not this, uh, you know, this is not like a basketball field. You, you exploit gaps, yes, but to do what eventually? You also have to narrow the, your own formation. It becomes, you get stuck between two Roman and it, it, two, two units. It's not so easy. It's not that finding a gap in information is automatically, oh, let's exploit it. You, you may not have the opportunity to do it, nor, nor the, the clear advantage of doing it, right? Uh, what's best is to route an entire formation. Now, that's different, right? And that 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 is creating really a collapse of an entire chunk of the line, which is different from having a gap, right? Um, as we've seen, uh, the, the greatest impact of the Alamanni was thought to be absorbed by extending the depth of the first line especially, and uh, so to create this wall that uh, uh, would also be uh, structured within itself in a particular fashion that 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 is interesting to to observe because Amianus uses particular terms that are kind of anachronistic but still still effective. So basically he says that the, f the Roman the first Roman line had these three layers of troops that he calls antepilani, astati, and primi ordines, right? So, what is interesting about this is these are all terms that are fa to be found in into Roman sources since very long time before, and and they don't have to be treated as mere anachronisms. And there is a military logic that I see in here is pretty clear. So the primi ordines was a term uh, once used for. Uh, the centurions of greater experience in commanding the first cortes of the astati and the principes and the triari, right? That here uh, that they were placed in front of, of the other troops in the first row. So what Amianus is talking about in here actually is a body of select warriors uh, more than officers, because officers would always kind of be in the front. But um, this this is speaking actually of a, of a layered like a, a, a real segmentation of troops so having basically the toughest most experienced most valorous troops in the very front of the formation which is generally speaking what all formations are about right and uh, and that will also oblige the unit to to behave in a certain way it's ridiculous when people think that units can change front in in every way like simply turning around right you know there is all a system within the unit which soldiers are used to, to follow the, the, the guy in the front, to, to use him as point of reference. There, there are also problems of, of width and of, of length of the space occupied, and so on. Here, uh, the toughest troops were uh, that had to engage in melee in the first line were posed in the front, like in uh, called primi ordines, right? 
then the astati instead. So uh, you know that the terms astati actually comes from uh, this. That are, it's complicated to explain, but originally these were units were called like this were because they were kept with the hasta. It was a lance, right? Of uh, a spear actually. Uh, eventually, they turned into the guys of the Polybian times that had nothing to do with uh, the, the spears, but rather with uh, they were kept with the famous uh, sword and, and heavy javelin. But here in fourth century, the term status in itself comes back to be actually pretty pretty eloquent by itself because th that th the spear came to be uh, to be the first weapon of the Roman legionnaire and. And therefore, uh, at this point, actually, the the uh, legionary uh, infantry was pretty uh, homogeneous, early equipped with this kind of weapons. So the study here represented the the larger number of, of the legionnaires, right? So you have this premium ordinance in the front, their toughest troops, equipped with with uh, with the spears as well and swords also, uh, as it would be. Normal at this point, and in, in, in the back, this other homogeneous amount of spearmen that that is the, the, the Roman front line, and then the Antesignani were uh, literally in Latin, those who are in front of the standards, right? The signia are the standards, ante is uh, in front of, right? Before. So this could be, um, Amiano says that they were arrayed several paces in front of the main formation in an effort to break up the enemy formations. Um, so, in my opinion, these were... Uh, I mean, there's just a huge debate, because nobody fundamentally knows, also in the other epochs, who the Antesignani properly were, right? And it was probably a fluid term used to define both troops that were like kind of an avant-garde, etc. I think in this case, however, uh, they, they are skirmishers. They are troops that are... Uh, Post, yeah, in the front, like skirmishers would, would be normally, and that had to the, the objective to to slow down and disorder the the enemy advance, and obviously the, the Alamanni would have skirmishers as well. So this wasn't probably much of a uh, you know genial idea, but pr probably the, the the tactical standard of the time, um, and also of other times, telling the truth. Um, and that, however, in this situation, it would come pretty pretty handy because uh, the, the big deal was to to stop the Germanic charge or at least to halt its I impetus. So um, this formation in depth, let's say, was congenial to it and it kind of made uh, sense, right? So you have skirmishers, then a line with best troops in the front and the other in the rear, and then another line in reserve, right? It's it makes perfect sense as the central body of the formation, and, um, and in fact, the same Amianos, by the way, calls the, the rest of the troops. By the way, I was still thinking about the the Antesignani, the troops who were into the formation in the arches proper, um, so the, the the thick formation, the post Signani, so those who come after the ensigns that were in the front, right? Uh, what is interesting is that. Um, the, the 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 battle stand the, the standard of the Roman army was was posed in, in the very center, and um, so as we've seen before on the right uh, uh, and left and uh, on the wings of this battle line, there would be uh, I mean it's still part of of the line proper but at their ex uh, lateral extremes, the auxilia palatina. So on the right, and this is what we can grasp for, for, for sort of how from the how the battle developed were deployed the cornuti and the bracchiati mm -hmm. um, they were arrayed in uh, close order at least uh, communus is the term that um, uh, Mianus uses so this uh, speaks for itself that were kind of heavy infantry on the road the road and the um, and we will see in the battle now uh, how why we think they were on the right because basically they intervene on the right Right. Well, why, when the Roman cavalry uh, wing on the right is uh, is wiped out, and as we have seen, the troops in the line furthest to the rear uh, made up a reserve mm -hmm. that had to to engage in case the enemy broke through through the front line. That that is what would happen, by the way, at one point, and. The 
the explicit order was to in fact to engage only in case of difficulty, not to move and to remain in, you know, in a prudent fashion in reserve, right? And we do not know exactly which kind of auxilia units that however are repeatedly mentioned by Amianus during the battle um, manned the first and second lines. Um, the, we know that Julian plays his elite units such as the Primiani Legion in, in the center and however it's possible that these troops uh, were also uh, recently uh, recruited and therefore were, weren't particularly experienced yet right that they had received military training but they didn't have a, a poor uh, war experience overall and these are things that matter on the battlefield and uh, on the right wing right outside of the formation the Romans would deploy its entire cavalry force now this is very important um, this units uh, were were deployed also with a similar kind of segmentation compared to the infantry with light skirmishers in the front to disrupt the enemy um, before uh, the heavy cavalry and this is important because uh, as we have seen before Germanic cavalry wasn't uh, particularly uh, highly trained as, as the Roman one but still it's its numbers impetus could could be overwhelming and that's what the Germans usually count on because of lack of further you know more complex uh, tactics and that's where you 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 invest the most in, and that's where the, 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 the Alemannic charges were so dreaded and so effective and the Romans would, would want to, to absorb them that would follow the um, cataphractari that were possibly the equitas cataphractari ambianensis that were to to launch a shock charge on a possibly uh, disordered enemy. On the Roman left wing, instead, uh, was Severus, that was guiding, in spite of having uh, been a magister equitum, so cavalry commander, actually infantry units. Hmm? Um, and as we have seen, uh, the further left of the Roman uh, formation was, uh, uh, I mean, was protected by the uh, this marshes and the aqueduct on the uh, Musaus stream. That is the stream that goes basically, um, you know, perpendicular to the battle lines of this battle. And that's w basically this. This stream goes from uh, all across the battlefield, and that's the one that is that flanks also the the Roman, uh, excuse me, the, the Germanic uh, right, uh, it crosses between the, let's say better, Germanic center and the Germanic ambush party uh, stage uh, deployed in the, in, the f in the woods. So this is also kind of a prudent uh, deployment that eventually, uh, that probably, you know, in perspective probably was aware of how the, the Germanic disposition so that, that it was conceived accordingly but more or less the, the probably the, the arrangement was already kind of foreseen uh, in general and uh, Julian Julian himself was with his comitatus of 200 guards and um, probably his other 160 bodyguards were um, dispatched to support the cavalry on the right wing mm -hmm. and we know that Julian uh, moved during the, uh, the, the battle across the ranks uh, with his troops also risking his life under enemy fire uh, but he was probably posed right more, more towards the right than the center because uh, one source says that he was actually on the right but eventually he moved back and forth sometimes encouraging his troops reminding them not to get carried away um, we'll see it better when reading Amianus, which is what we're going to do now. So uh, let's get ready because we finally <laughs> go. And this was a necessary premise to understand a lot of things about this battle that is, as we will see now, are uh, are necessary. So now we will read from Amianus uh, Res Geste, Book 16, Chapter uh, 12. 
Mm. So we are, uh, of course, also in 357, if your book indicates the date you want to look at, just a reminder. And uh, we'll simply read and comment. So I, I remind you that uh, Amiano's account is by far the most complete and one to get most information from. The other two um, uh, are fundamentally Libanius and Zosimus that provide some, some information that is important also for, for the rest of the campaign but that we haven't analyzed today. But about the battle, it's Amianus, right? And we'll see now. We will we'll comment gradually by reading and commenting. So Amianus says, when this disgraceful disaster had become known, so he's talking about the, the Julian's advance, uh, Cnodomarius and uh, Vestralpus, the kings of the Aldemanni, and Urius and Ursicinus with Serapion, and Sumarius and Ortarius, having collected all their forces into one body, uh, encamped near the city of Strasbourg. Thinking that Caesar, Julian, uh, from fear of imminent danger, had retreated at the very time that he was fully occupied with completing a fortress to enable him, enable him to make a permanent stand. Their confidence. So it's interesting because it tells you that you know the uh, the the that there is also this need of field for, of fortifications in general to to halt the advance. This is a famous uh, defense in in depth of which also Lutwak talks about it. It was a pretty effective strategy, right? That was more or less always used. It's not that it corresponds to particular phases in Rome. But given the incursions, uh, this was important because it could um, always uh, uh, contain, but also uh, take uh, from the rear, the, the cut off the, the enemy lines of communication if they advance too, too deeply, etc. So, um, and at this time, the, the Alemanni also didn't have much of a, you know, polyurcetic scales, if none at all, basically, so they, this ammo posts were also fairly difficult to storm, if properly guarded. So going on, their confidence uh, and assurance of success was increased, the one of the Alamanni, uh, by one of the Scutari, who deserted to them, so this was uh, the, the turncoat that we were talking about before, is a uh, Scutarius of the Roman army, who fearing punishment for some offense which he had committed, crossed over to them after the departure of Barbazio and assured them that Julian had now only 13,000 men remaining with him. For that was the number of troops that he had now with him, while the ferocious barbarians were stirring up attacks upon him from all sides. So here, all the guerrilla and the attacks we were talking about before. So uh, this disturbance is that that they are pretty uh, that they are a strong way of warfare. Like they, they they do produce a lot of attrition. They they they're very dangerous. They they wear out uh, resources, both um, moral and material ones. And as he constantly adhered to the same story, they were excited to make more haughty attempts by the confidence with which he inspired them, and sent ambassador in an imperious tone to Caesar. So we're talking about Chronomarius, demanding that he should retire from the territory which they had acquired by their own valor in arms. But he, as a stranger to fear, and not liable to be swayed either by anger or by disappointment, despised the arrogance of the barbarians, and detaining the ambassadors till he had completed the works of his camp, remained immovable on his ground with admirable constancy. So the Alemanni were hoping for Julian to, to make things in a hasty fashion, so he he doesn't he doesn't bait. But King Cnodomarius moving a about in every direction and being always the first to undertake dangerous enterprises kept everything in continual agitation and confusion being full of arrogance and pride as one whose head was turned by repeated success this is a bit of a roman literary stereotype i mean the idea that the barbarians are kind of uh, ex easily excited by success that they that they're kind of irrational and they, they eventually get punished because they weren't prudent like the romans are Oh, but here the logic, the real logics are, you know, unknown. Probably that they were kind of rational from from both sides, right? 
um, for he had defeated the Caesar the census in a pitched battle and he had plundered and destroyed many wealthy cities and he had long ravaged all Gaul at his own pleasure without meeting with any resistance and his confidence was now increased by the recent retreat of a general superior to him in the number and strength of his forces that is Barbazio, right so Claudio Myers right, is thinking he has really a lot of power which he has for the Alamanni, beholding the emblems on their shields, so that a few predatory bands of their men had wrestled those districts from those soldiers whom they had formerly never engaged, but with fear, and by whom they had often been routed with much loss. And these circumstances made Julian very anxious because after the defection of Barbazio, he himself, under the pressure of absolute necessity, was compelled to encounter very populous tribes with but a ver very few, though brave, troops. And now, the sun being fully risen, the trumpets sounded, and the infantry were led forth from the camp in slow march, and their flanks were arrayed the squadrons of cavalry among which were both the cuirassiers, so this would be the cataphracts, basically, and the archers. Troops whose equipment was very formidable. And since from the spot from which the Roman standards had first advanced to the rampart of the barbarian camp were 14 leagues, that is to say 1 in 20 miles, Caesar, carefully providing for the advantage and safety of his army, called in the skirmishers who had gone out in front and having ordered silence in his usual voice while they all stood in battalions around him addressed them in his natural tranquillity of voice and here's the speech uh, the necessity of providing for our common safety to say the least of it compels me and i am no prince of abject spirit to exhort you my comrades to rely so much on your own nature and vigorous valor as to follow my counsels in adopting a prudent manner of enduring or repelling the evils which we anticipate rather than resort to an over hasty mode of action which must be doubtful in its issue for though amid dangers youth ought to be energetic and bold so also in cases of necessity it should show itself manageable and prudent now what i think best to be done if your option accords with mine and if your just indignation will endure it, I will briefly explain. Already noon is approaching, we are weary with our march, and if we advance we shall enter upon the rugged paths where we can hardly see our way. As the moon is waning, the night will not be lighted up by any stars. The earth is burnt up with the heat, um, and will afford us no supplies of water. And even if by any contrivance we could get over these difficulties comfortably, still when the swarms of the enemy fall upon us, refreshed as they will be, uh, with rest, meat and drink, what will become of us? What strength will there be in our weary limbs, exhausted as we shall, we shall be uh, with hunger, thirst and toil, to encounter them? Therefore, since the most critical difficulties are often overcome by skillful arrangements, and since after good counsel has been taken in good part, divine-looking remedies have often re-established affairs which seemed to be tottering, I entreat you to let us here surround it as we are with uh, foss and rampart, take our repose, after first parcelling out our regular watches and then having refreshed ourselves with sleep and food as well as the time will allow let us under the protection of god with the earliest dawn move forth our conquering eagles and standards to reap a certain triumph the soldiers would hardly allow him to finish his speech uh, gnashing their feet and showing their eagerness for combat by beating their shields with their spears and entreating at once to be led against the enemy already in their sight, relying on the favor of the God of heaven and on their own valor and on the proved courage of their fortunate general. And as the result proved, it was a certain kind genius that was present with them, thus prompting them to fight 
while still under his inspiration. And this eagerness of theirs was further stimulated by the full approval of the officers of high rank, and especially of Florentius, the prefect of the Praetorian Guard, who openly gave his opinion for fighting at once while the enemy were in the solid mass in which they were now ranged. Admitting, uh, admitting the danger indeed, but still thinking in the uh, it the wisest plan, because if the enemy once dispersed it would have been possible to restrain the soldiers, at all times inclined by their natural vehemence of disposition towards sedition, and they were likely to be, as he thought, so indignant at being denied the victory they sought, as to be easily tempted to the most lawless violence. Two other considerations also added to the confidence of our men. First, because they recollected that in a previous year, when the Romans spread themselves in every direction over the countries on the other side of the Rhine, not one of the barbarians stood to defend his home, nor ventured to encounter them, but they contented themselves with blockading the, the roads in every direction with vast abatis throughout the whole winter reti retiring into the remote districts and willing endured the greatest hardships rather than fight. Recollecting also that, after the emperor actually invaded their territories, the barbarians neither ventured to make any resistance nor even to show themselves at all, but implored peace in the most suppliant manner till they obtained it. But no one considered that the times were changed, because the barbarians were at that time pressed with a threefold danger. The emperor hastening against them through the Tyrol, the Caesar was actually in their country cutting off all possibility of retreat, while the neighboring tribes, whom recent quarrels had converted into enemies, were all but treading on their heels, and thus they were surrounded on all sides. But since the time the emperor, having granted them peace, had returned in to Italy, and the neighboring tribes, having all cause of quarrel removed, were again in alliance with them, and the disgraceful retreat of one of the Roman generals had increased their natural confidence and boldness. Moreover, there was another circumstance which, at this crisis, added weight to the difficulties which pressed upon the Romans. The two royal brothers who had obtained peace from Constantius in the preceding year being bound by the obligation of that treaty, neither ventured to raise any disturbance, nor indeed to put themselves in motion at all. But a little after the conclusion of that piece of uh, one of them, whose name was Gundomatus, and who was the most loyal and most famous, uh, faithful to his ward, was slain by treachery, and then all his tribe joined our enemies. And on this tribe of Badomarius, also against his will, as he affirmed, ranged itself on the side of the barbarians who were arming for war. Therefore, since all the soldiers of every rank, from the highest to the lowest, approved of engaging instantly and would not relax the least from the rigor of their determination, on a sudden the standard bearer shouted out, Go forth, O Caesar, most fortunate of all princes, go whither thy better fortune leads thee. At least we have learnt by your example the power of valour and military skill. Go on and lead us as a fortunate and gallant champion. You shall see what a soldier under the eye of, of a warlike general, a witness of the exploit of each individual can do, and how little with the favour of the deity any obstacle can avail against him. When these words were heard without a moment's delay, the whole army advanced and approached a hill of moderate height, covered with ripe corn and at no great distance from the banks of the Rhine. On its summit were posted three cavalry soldiers of the enemy as scouts, who at once hastened back to their comrades to announce that the Roman army was at hand. But one infantry soldier who was with them, not being able to keep up with them, was taken prisoner by the activity of some of our soldiers and informed us that the Germans had been passing over the river for three days and three nights. And when our generals beheld them at no great distance forming their men into solid columns, they halted and formed all the first ranks of their troops into a similarly solid body, 
with equal caution the enemy likewise halted. And when in consequences of this halt the enemy saw, as the deserter I mentioned above had informed them, that all our cavalry was ranged against them in our right wing, they uh, then they posted all their own cavalry in close order on their left wing. So here it basically says that uh, it's it's the Germans were ranged in the way to, to meet the Romans. Before we said it was the other way around, but we'll see here we, we don't really know and probably uh, yeah this is an important witness, but you know the important is that they did at the end of the day. Uh, and with them, they mingled every here and there a few infantry skirmishers and light armed soldiers, which indeed was a very wise maneuver. For they knew that a cavalry soldier, however skillful, if fighting with one of our men in complete armor, while his hands were occupied with shield and bridle, so that he could uh, use no offensive weapon, but the spear which he brandished in his right hand, could never injure an enemy wholly covered with iron mail. But that an infantry soldier amid the actual struggles of personal conflict, when noticing is usually guarded against by a combatant, uh, except that which is straight before him, may crawl unperceivedly along the, uh, the ground, and piercing the side of the Roman soldier's horse, throw the rider down headlong, rendering him thus an easy victim. When these dispositions had been thus made, the barbarians also protected their right flank with secret ambuscades and snares. Now the wall of these warlike and savage tribes were on this day under the command of Gnodomarius and Serapio, monarchs of more power than any of their former kings. Gnodomarius was indeed the wicked instigator of the world war, and bearing on this head a helmet blazing like fire, he led on the left wing with great boldness, confiding much on his vast personal strength. And now, with great eagerness from the impending battle, he mounted a spirited horse, that by the increased height he might be more conspicuous, learning, leaning upon a spear of most formidable size, and remarkable for the splendor of his arms. Being indeed a prince who had, no, on former occasions, shown himself brave as a warrior and a general, eminent for skill above his fellows. The right wing was led by Serapio, a youth whose beard had hardly grown, but who was beyond his years in courage and strength. He was the son of Medericus Meder uh, and the brother of Ctonomarius, a man throughout his whole life of the greatest perfidy. He had received the name of Serapio because his father, having been given as a hostage had been detained in Gaul for a long time and had there learned some of the mysteries of the Greeks in consequences of which had changed the name of his son who at his birth was named Agenaricus into that of Serapius. These two leaders were followed by five other kings who were but little inferior in power to themselves by ten petty princes, a vast number of nobles and 35,000 armed men collected from various nations partly by pay and partly by a promise of requiting their service by similarly assist, uh, similar assistance on a f future day. The trumpets now gave forth a terrible sound. Severus, the Roman general in command of the left wing, when he came near the ditches filled with armed men, for which the enemy had arranged that of those who were there concealed should suddenly rise up and throw the Roman line into confusion, halted boldly, and suspecting some yet hidden ambuscade, neither attempted to retreat nor advance. Now, this part of Severus is very fascinating, because when we think of this uh, uh, ambushes, we, we don't have to think probably of something uh, completely uh, orderly, f f which, you know, uh, all of the enemies jump out, uh, out of, uh, at a single moment and the surprise did the uh, did uh, you know the the, the uh, their enemies uh, uh, as if th those had not uh, sensed anything. Of course, every a position that could offer this kind of protection, like a woods, etc., uh, is uh, uh, a place you have to be aware. And Severus was surely skilled enough to understand that the situation was uh, was uh, suspicious. Let's say. And probably also because 
uh, we can imagine some Germanic warrior kind of jumping out on his own to help prove his individual bravery as the warrior that he was and, you know, uh, screwing everything up because, you know, he, uh, he didn't give a damn about discipline. He didn't know what discipline was in the first place and just wanted to, to do that eventually to, to get killed, right? So uh, we don't have to think it like a, a clean situation where, yeah, everybody stays at it, at its place. No, there were this phenomena and uh, you, you could sense that in the air and... Uh, uh, the, the, the Germans were famous for their ambushes and probably b something had been spotted and since Severus is very clever because he doesn't uh, he, he does he stops advancing, uh, advancing but he doesn't retreat either so he remains there and waits uh, for for the situation to evolve which is pretty uh, it's a pretty responsible thing to do at that point in my opinion uh, so going on Seeing this, Julian, always full of courage at the moment of the greatest difficulty, uh, galloped with an escort of 200 cavalry through the ranks of the infantry at full speed, addressing them with words of encouragement uh, as the critical circumstances in which they were placed required. Right. So this is important. Look at your general that is going back and forth. It's not that the general has to at this point. Uh, much of this 200 cavalry is probably... Um, you know, uh, here there may be some question about it in the sense that probably not all the 200 cavalrymen, uh, or maybe yes, who knows, uh, galloped, uh, I mean, they, they, you know, uh, ran uh, all together uh, amidst the lines. Um, it can't, they can't provide a guard, and of course they can, uh, but pro there might have been also less. Uh, Simply for, for one thing, not, not because it's impossible to, to make such movements mo among the lines, because it's possible. Don't we? We've seen that uh, you know between the two lines there was a lot of space, for example, and further space even be within the same line, uh, line length. Uh, but simply because those 200 cavalry can prove of some use, right? Uh, at one point, maybe this is a reserve, is intervening in the fight, so that you don't want to to tire them excessively. I mean, you as a general, you have a symbolic uh, role and uh, appearing among the, the troops is uh, is kind of uh, comforting for them, but still, you want to preserve 200 cavalry, right? If you have 13,000 men, it, it maybe it doesn't make an excessive difference, but it can still be useful, right? Uh, otherwise, it's possible also to th the country, so I'm just speculating, telling the truth going on and as the extent of the space over which they were spread and the uh, densestness of the multitude thus collected into one body would not allow him to address the wall army right so he here specifies that he couldn't go everywhere with his cavalry uh, and also because on other accounts he wished to avoid exposing himself to the malice of envy as well as not to uh, affect that which Augustus thought belonged exclusively to himself so he did rivalry between him and Constantius II. Uh, Julian, while taking care of himself as he passed within reach of the darts of the enemy, encouraged all whom his voice could reach, whether known or unknown to him, to fight bravely with these and similar wars. Now this is very interesting because uh, it talks essentially about the, um, uh, the, the, the possibility uh, first of all it says uh, that the darts were flying all around now this is interesting as well because it means at this point that the armies are pretty close, right? They are uh, at least some some hundred meter uh, away, and um, the uh, the Alamanni were uh, so talking about the, the missile potential of the armies of the fourth century. The Romans were like the masters of it. The Romans at this time used among their infantry that they, they, they were basically all trained to use bows. Um, the plumbata, uh, there were basically a certain throwing darts you threw with your own hands. They had a pretty high, pretty damn high penetrability. Um, uh, that they 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 launched at several tens of meters of distance, uh, and it also catapults. Even here, they're not mentioned, um, but the Alemanni would have, of course, archers on their own. And uh, other forms of darts that probably now weren't being used because there's still not an excessive range there are the uh, anguns, right? The anguns are basically the Germanic response or equivalent to 
in terms of this of the de of degree of penetrability of the Roman pilum that at this point is not used anymore, but at a, among the Romans, but that is uh, that in this sense it's really and it's used in, in a similar fashion, right? Basically in the identical fashion, that is to throw all this. Um, Angons all together in one shot and then charging the enemy, exploiting the disorder that all of this uh, hail of, uh, of, of javel heavy you know, javelins has produced among the enemy ranks. The first ranks that are most important ones that have to keep um, the, the wall formation t together from, th from the front, right? So um, this, this was a pretty happy connubium uh, with the Germans that uh, were good basically uh, there was one thing the Germans basically did better than anyone else that's the only thing they did. charging right that the the Lamanic charges were overwhelming that there was no other people at this point that had the same strength of an infantry charge at this point so this um, exchange of missiles the distance is very important because it's naturally aimed from both sides it's softening up the enemy ranks and hopefully disordering them and it creates um, um, also Aside from the physical, the material damage can uh, it it um, it, uh, it it renders you nervous. Like it, it, it's terrible to be under constant fire that never ends. I mean, you're already extremely tense. And imagine just arrows and darts flying uh, all around you. That's that doesn't make you feel better, right? So it's a very subtle, very effective psychological warfare. Just then. Uh, material one, as it always is. I'll always remember, war is uh, a clash between moral strengths. Uh, as, uh, the, the physical side is, is secondary, right? That's your will to fight that is a stake here, not really, not even your uh, your dining in, in combat, but most likely you will die in the pursuit. You know? Yeah, I mean, your route and we're pur being pur pursued by the enemy. And um, and so there's our speech of, of Julian says now my uh, comrades they fit time for fighting has arrived so yeah here we are about to begin the time which I as well as you have long desired and which you just now invited when with gestures of impatience you demanded to be led on again when he came to those in the rear rank who were posted in reserve behold said he my comrades the long wished for day is at hand which incites us all to wash out former stains and to restore to its proper brightness the Roman majesty. These men before you are barbarians, whom their uh, own rage and intemperate madness have urged forward to meet with the destruction of their fortunes, defeated as they will now be by our might. Presently, when making better dispositions for the array of some troops by long experience in war had attained to greater skill, uh, he aided his arrangements by these exhortations. Let us rise up like brave men. Let us by our native valor repeal the disgrace which has uh, at one time been brought upon our arms, from contemplating which it, it was that after much delay I consented to take the name of Caesar. But to any whom he so inconsiderately demanding the signal to be given for instant battle, and likely by their rash movements to be inattentive to orders, he said, I entreat you not to be too eager in your pursuit of the flying enemy, so as to risk losing the glory of the victory which awaits us, and also never to retreat, except under the last necessity. For I shall certainly take no care of those who flee, but among those who press onto the slaughter of the enemy I shall be present and share with you indiscriminately, provided only that your charge be made with moderation and prudence. While repeatedly addressing these and similar exhortations to the troops, he drew up the principal part of his army opposite to the front rank of the barbarians. And suddenly there arose from the Alemanni a great shout, mingled with the indignant cries, all exclaiming with one voice that the princes ought to leave their horses and fight in the ranks on equal terms with their men, lest if any mischance should occur they should avail themselves of the facility of escaping and leave the mass of the army in miserable plight. Like, this is very beautiful. 
as is one of the most beautiful passages of the account because it tells you uh, how powerful uh, the uh, the middle class in 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 uh, within the Alamanni society was at this point so much uh, at the point that these freemen would tell to 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 the nobles like uh, dismount from your horses because you fight just like us on foot and therefore you can't escape and you die with us and things go wrong um, this is extremely meaningful because uh, it's a struggle that exists uh, in, in many societies that has to do with the attempts of, uh, of the nobility to take over society and this was an attempt during the migration era was pretty alive um, was pretty present among uh, the Germans and uh, that as we've seen the, the Germanic aristocracy has tried uh, with the excuse of the you know of the necessities that were brought by war so that put them in a condition of leading and having their before disposing of cer certain power to to impose their kind of monarchic direction to the rest of their uh, community right and and, uh, and therefore it's very interesting because you would expect now the, the Alemanni to shout all together like the, the war cry battle instead they shout against their own princes like saying uh, you 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 suck because by the way uh, you suck why because at, at the time especially among these uh, Central European populations but among, among also others the, the idea of fighting horseback um, I mean was um, generally perceived like you know if, if you fight in fact on horseback you can run away so it was kind of an idea on a coward it's it's like a bit what you see uh, also with the Anglo-Saxons etc I mean the idea that they didn't fight on foot they dismounted to fight and therefore we have this cliche that they they never fought on horseback but it's actually false of course they fought on horseback um, the problem is that it was seen like a, a ritual of warfare to, to fight among us all the others because objectively you know if, if you're on horseback you can't flee it's it's realistic right um, and and here to 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 prove their commitment they're obliged right to to dismount and to fight alongside the rest of the freemen it's very very beautiful uh, and it tells you a lot also on the power that in this sense infantry had over cavalry over these societies because they they could I mean, they could literally impose that politically, hence militarily, as war is a political act. So, uh, yeah, German infantry, uh, German armies were mostly about infantry at this point, and that was the, the bulk of their power, especially in this Western Germanic population. So, going on, um, when this was known, Knodomarius immediately leapt down from his horse. Mm -hmm. So, even the the, the most powerful element of the arm, this mouse. And the rest of the princes followed his example without hesitation. For indeed, none of them doubted but that their side would be victorious, right? So they did so, at least Armianus says, because they were <laughs> sure of winning, right? <laughs> Not because they, because otherwise it would have gone away, probably. Or who knows why, how it would have gone. Uh, it's a bit difficult to think they would have turned, um, like, one against the other, but and but it, but it might have undermined the same the same morale, right? There was generally high, uh, as far as we can understand. Instead, then the signal for battle being given as usual by the sound of trumpets, the armies rushed to the combat with all their force. Right. So here the co combat really begins. Um, I mean in melee. First of all, javelins were hurled, and the Germans hastening on with the utmost impetuosity, brandishing their javelins in their right hands, dashed among the squadrons of our cavalry, uttering fearful cries. Mm. So, <coughs> excuse me. Here switches to the to the Roman right and Germanic left, right. And we have the the light cavalrymen that rush against Roman cavalry. Um, so. This is particularly interesting, uh, at least in the way it's described, and shouting, also for, because your horses can get agitated by that. And they had excited themselves to more than, than the usual rage, right? Their flowing hair 
bristling with their eagerness and fury blazing from their eyes. So this is the f the famous Furor Teutonicus, right? And this is very important because it shows the 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 that exaltation, that um, spiritual as well, you know, physical uh, state that uh, the Germanic warriors were famous for, and uh, that was uh, actually de destined to just a part of them, uh, actually a minority, that were thought to, to be in contact with the divinity, being possessed, basically. And it was also a dramatic story, mostly pertained to these marginated individuals that often joined the comitatus, were extremely violent, sometimes even on uh, hallucinating substances, etc., so that uh, they were quite dangerous. But the fact that they were engaging against cavalry with and the, the Amianus ac associates the two things might be that you know uh, kind of makes sense because attacking cavalry, uh, especially when it's attacking you and it's it's psychologically devastating. Like I, I have to be crazy. In fact, like uh, here it's not really madness. It's madness for maybe for the Romans of the fourth century, but it's it's more than that. It's being possessed, right? So it's something that goes beyond ra rationality, and that's what you need in order to engage cavalry in. in in front of you, right? That's terrible, right? And it's effective, <laughs> though, as we will see now. It says, uh, while in opposition to them, our soldiers, standing steadily, protecting their heads with their bulwark uh, of their shields and drawing their swords or brandishing their javelins, equally threaten death to their assailants. Now, this is also very beautiful because it tells you that the Romans were instead um, stopping. And this actually they were steady, they were fixed. This emphasizes the, the, the need that the Alemanni had to, to attack, right? So it, it, it goes beyond the tactical dimension here. It has to do with the motivation of the Alemanni that had to meet the Romans in open terms in attacking. But it's also this general behavior of... Uh, I mean, here I'm not sure whether... Uh, I mean, probably the Alemanni were literally attacking Probably, but not charging with the whole mass of the troops. There, there was the first exalted guys, especially the youngers, you know, the, the Germanic youth that was lighter, uh, more agile uh, because of age, etc. That had to prove this, uh, you know, this military value that were sent in uh, among the, uh, as skirmishing elements, like to, to engage the enemy and to start the, the making this bravado act and obviously risking their life. That's how. You know, bands of warriors were formed. The, the, the younger generations were were tested right in front of the eyes of the more skilled, uh, grizzled veterans. Let's say that stayed within the 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 the, the infantry line, right? The, the I mean the, the formation, the and uh, the spears wall. We we can't say, and um, so the Romans do not react in the sense they they stay fixed and they. Um, they protect their heads with uh, shields, so forming this um, formation that is would be the fulcon the sil uh, that derives from the same Germanic practice, but it's similar to to the in part to the Testudo formation conceptually. Is this idea you protect yourself from from projectiles? Given you're you're an open ground, you have no other better option to to protect uh, yourself from missile fire, and it's still throwing javelins on their turn. Let's remember th the Romans had javeliners as well and they were probably archers were detached in, in the rear of the first line but they were also probably in part against their spurs among the ranks or at least they, were, they could go back and forth in front of the lines as it was often. Very remember that between the units there was always some space, some corridor could be exploited for doing this. So this was what not the main moment to attack, and, and the Romans, and their, with their discipline, of course, they were cold-blooded, not to engage the enemy. It was highly provoking, and and here it's not much of a mechanic thing once again, but a psychological one because here these guys are really harassing you. I mean, they're coming, they're shouting at you. They have their uh, th th you can't see their hate. They destroy you, you know, deadly darts, and you, they, they they provoke you. Like your first instinct is go there. And and bit the hell out of them, right? And you can't because you know because you have been trained, and especially you re if you do something wrong, if you set forth uh, her formation, uh, this is going to be pretty serious for the cohesion of the whole unit, and uh, you will be likely punished or 
chances are you will die anyway because you're gonna uh, go out there and said so the Romans remain right there they 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 also draw their swords because even if some German warriors are attacking uh, uh, the, their their shield wall as well they're running against them uh, hitting them hard jumping on them and um, and therefore doing damage like being uh, you know pretty pretty nasty pretty pretty annoying so going on and while in the very conflict of battle the cavalry kept their gallant squadrons in close order and the infantry strengthened their flanks standing shoulder to shoulder with closely locked shields closed um, excuse me clouds of thick dust arose and the battle rocked to and fro our men sometimes advancing sometimes receding right so here we are um, in the in the moment in which the, the, the situation gets heated up because the Alemanni are probably starting to launch kind of more consistent charges and the Romans have to engage all together like this is the moment in which you're called like if you were an individual soldier in the line you would start being uh, you know addressed to 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 engage the enemy as a unit in remaining formation and meeting this this and this charges and uh, and the, t the typical um, combat, like the, basically in all times of human history, independent from any level of training, etc., is simply these masses of men, thickly packed masses of men, that basically fight for like 30 seconds and then detach and they, they, they go back and forth once again. They rest, they, they rearrange, they reform, and they do it once again. And that's literally how a battle is. Like you will never see a melee like in Hollywood, where there are people, you know, dispersed everywhere. That there is no order. Like there is always an order. Like the the broader formation can get messed up. It can break, and that's where usually people stop fighting and start running, right? But at an individual level, to these units, smaller tens of hundreds, they they remain compact in some way, and and they do that, and that's how real fights are. And uh, and it's tough, really, because uh, you, t you tire down pretty easily, and it's a dramatically uh, traumatic experience. Like a lot of violence, a lot of blood, a lot of hits, a lot of pain. Um, you don't know how it's turning out, but you can start t uh, testing the enemy strengths as well. So, and that's where probably Roman infantry like was was uh, you know holding on average harder than than the Germans, right? And 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 also the Germans probably at this point were as we were saying, tendentially sending in like the the least experienced troops but the, the most impetuous ones. So this was the moment however in which also other more uh you know experienced troops were engaging. So this was the being lightened up like a, a like full scale engagement. It was pretty pretty tough. And going on, um, so it's beautiful that Amianus says here, uh, sometimes advances, sometimes receding. So that's essentially how death is. It's like waves on, on the seashore, right? They, they go back and forth. That's how a real combat is. And going on, some of, of the most powerful warriors among the barbarians pressed up upon their antagonists with their knees, trying to throw them down, right? Uh, this is great uh, because it... it tells you, you know, that the Germans were running on the, this is, has the most powerful warriors among the barbarians, so these were people that, you know, the Germans were on average pretty tall at this point, and the myth is that the Romans were short and the Germans were taller, and, 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 and this myth was actually fabricated by the same Romans because they had to prove the value of discipline and spiritual values com uh, counterposed to uh, in discipline and physical value, so the germ the average German is the giant that you know is so big but also so weak on the longer resistance but this actually is the stereotypization of something that mostly um, is reflected strategically speaking i mean it's about it's not that an individual German is so less resilient i i can't, I doubt it because they they also lived in pretty tough environments themselves. The point is that they didn't have enough, like their logistics sucked, they had a few a few supplies, so their armies tended to, to melt away more easily in that sense because they lacked kind of wine uh, thing to, to eat and 
and that's also why they concentrated all their force in, on this very heavy charges, right? And therefore, the, the strongest, but the, the, in reality, the, 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 especially at this time, the, the Roman soldier and Germanic soldier weren't that difficult. We've seen the word Germans and Celts from the same Roman side, were perfectly Romanized. But it's important that Damiano states that these most powerful warriors, like so that they could exploit their physical prowess and, and bravery, could literally um, charge and kick the, the enemy, I mean the Roman shield wall, so they're hoping to, to bring the, the shield down and to, to smash. And believe me, like, you know, we think of this like uh, little kicks, like this could be guys who took all the uh, all the space to, to run and, 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 and jump like think about of a muscular one meter like a six one foot tall man that, that, that smashes with 80 90 uh, kilos uh, you know, running into into a shield wall I mean that can make a massive uh, impact really and it's crazy it's crazy because the guy most likely gets killed but um, it still disorders the, the enemy formation. So it's the, the, here is the, the, the German I individualism that that is at its best, but it, it's in fact from the other side the Roman collective training that the, an the copes with that pretty damn effectively, right? At the same time, and yet and yet it's very hard, right? It doesn't grant you victory uh, cent for cent. Obviously, not, not even that's not even probably the the, the most uh, determining factor, but. Uh, at an individual level, but on the longer run, it is right because the the Germans lack more cohesion. Um, and going on, and in the general excitement, men fought hand to hand, shield pressing upon shield. Right, this is also shield was pressing, and uh, and that's the, the matter of muscles, really. It, it, it is brute force in part, but also this ability of sticking together and having done it all before in a military training, in a professional training, and have not done it, if not in a, you know, among clansmen from the other side, uh, like family members, relatives, friends, and stuff like that. And it's pretty damn bloody. Like, you, you have to imagine, like, blood spurts now everywhere, like, people dying on the ground, you know, belly, like, got spilled, and it, it's it's pretty rough, like that you would see. I mean, this is plain butcher. Let's be honest about that. A human body is pretty damn soft. You can cut it open so damn easily. You can you can make a random cause a random things in a in a situation like this. And think at the same time, old darts uh, flying constantly. Like I think an ancient battle. We would we would be impressed by this this content this air crossed constantly by javelins by arrows stuff like that um, and um, where were we when the shield pressing machines yeah. okay while they haven't resounded with the loud cries of the conquerors and of the dying like here you start hearing like people dying and their cries and, and all yeah, that's a really pitiful uh, vision. And presently, when our left wing, advancing forward, had driven back with superior strength the vast bands of the German assailants, and was itself advancing with loud cries against the enemy, our cavalry on the right wing uh, unexpectedly retreated in disorder. But when the lingering fugitives came upon those in the rear, they halted, perceiving themselves covered by legions, and renewed the battle. Now, there's quite some explanation because here in Mianus talks about what was happening on, on, on the wings from the Roman side. So on the left, Severus had has, had got it right, because at this point, basically, uh, they, they had spotted the German ambush. So the Alamanni came out of the wood and attacked the Romans, and uh, without any order, because they were in ditches, like they weren't ordered in a formation. They'd come out altogether, screaming, assaulting, etc., but the Romans stayed there, steady uh, repelling them. It's easy because it's not like a, a body mass, it's like all scattered troops. You can, of course they, they had some sort of cohesion, uh, but uh, it was surely more than, uh, less, way less than the one th the Roman left wing slowly marching and stopping had maintained, right? So in fact, Amiano says, you know, Severus takes them out, right? So, um, uh, and was keeping to advance, 
right? This is also important. So the, the, the Germans on the right are faring pretty badly, but on the left, they're doing very well instead because here it says that the, Ro uh, the Roman cavalry um, says unexpectedly retreated in disorder. Hmm. Um, and and um, and it's interesting because here Amianus uh, adjusts a bit the, the story. Um, from this point of view, um, um, Zosimus um, is, is more correct because he says Julian possessed a regiment of 600 horse which were well disciplined and in whose valor and experience he so confided that he ventured great part of his hopes upon their performances. Indeed, when the battle commenced, the whole army attacked the enemy with all the resolution they could show. But some time afterwards, though the Roman army had considerably the advantage, it's probably referring to, to Severus, these were the only troops that fled. and left their station so dishonorably that when Caesar rode up to them with a small party and called them back to share of the victory, he could not by any means prevail on them to turn. Now, as we, as we, this is realistic, right? Um, basically, the right uh, wing, the Roman cavalry uh, breaks, and because the Germans managed to knock out it, and Am Am Amianus actually talks in detail about this now, but but he also adds that, as it's written here, that uh, this fleeing cavalry was stopped by the guys in the rear, and uh, it's it's not really realistic. Um, the uh, these were very heavy cavalry and they're probably very difficult to reorder as well so if they broke it's not that I mean there is general consensus among scholars that they that they were useless albeit I think Libanius said but I'm not wrong uh, I don't remember that, that the, uh, part of the cavalry reformed uh, and came back to the battle maybe also to pursue the enemy which is possible because usually such things happen but it's not that that point the unit as itself, also especially in, in its formation, has a consistency anymore. Like it's uh, now it's broke. You can use the cavalry in theory to, to pursue someone else, especially the lighter one that probably has not engaged. So uh, st it has still to basically just engage a fleeing enemy, right? But the especially the heavier cavalry that probably also suffered heavy losses, as we'll see now. Um, is not intended in here, and Amanus even says that, uh, and and especially like that that this um, that they, you know, perceive themselves covered by the legions and renew the battle. Let's see, realistic. Zosimus is more probably more likely right, right, and Amianus is is talking a bit in propagandistic terms. And in fact, now we we can read what he says because to understand better how he develops the thing. He covers a bit up the, the thing, but here basically the Germans on their left uh, destroyed, the, the, or at least routed the the Roman right wing. And reading Amianus on this, this disaster, because he explains, had arisen from the Corsair, so the cataphracts, um, a seeing their commander slightly wounded and one of their comrades crushed under the weight of his own arms and of his horse which fell upon him while they were changing their position on which they all fled uh, as each could and would have trampled down the infantry and thrown everything into confusion if the infantry had not steadily kept their ranks and, and stood immovable supporting each other right julian uh, when from a distance he saw uh, his cavalry thus seeking safety in flight spurred his horse towards them and himself stopped them like a, a barrier right this is pretty realistic generally in general right uh, first of all it says yeah that this rector in Latin is the the guy that they see um, uh, wounded and this other guy that falls because he breaks his um, uh, his, his arms under his horse uh, so they were out for no reason no th this is the Germans that came under the horses started butchering them down the corn field uh, hit their damp uh, from the above and so probably the, the Germanic cavalry had managed to absorb the uh, the 
cataphract charge and we don't know how they coped with horse archers um, but we don't have any reference to those in the sources uh, during combat uh, but um, uh, I mean this fact the infantry stopped their retreat they this then because at, by the way the same Amianus afterwards doesn't talk about cavalry so it's obvious that it flapped in, in the opinion of all scholars actually um, and here the fact that Julian stopped them just like on his horse running towards them like uh, you know it's kind of I mean it's a beautiful picture because then he says but it's not realistic he says for has Julian was at once recognized by his purple standard of the dragon which was fixed to the top of a long spear waving its fringe as a real dragon sheds its skin the tribune of one squadron halted and turning pale with alarm hastened back to renew the battle right and then as it's customary um, in critical moments Julian gently reproached his men with her uh, said he gallant comrades are you retreating are you ignorant that flight which never ensures safety proves the folly of having made a vain attempt let us return to our army to be partakers of their glory and not rashly desert, desert uh, those who are fighting for the Republic. Saying these words in a dignified tone, he led them all back to discharge their duties in the fight, imitating this the ancient he uh, hero Sulla. If we make allowances for the difference of situation, for when Sulla, having led his army against Archelaus, the general of Mitridates, this is the Battle of Chaeronea, if I'm not wrong, became exhausted because um, the, the, the whole army had broken and Sulla took his, uh, you know, he, he went to fight, to fight kind of alone and this, allegedly this, the soldiers came back to fight, so it's the same thing. Obviously in the 4th century, uh, I mean, these were uh, echoing uh, examples in literature, it had become a kind of also literally style to, to uh, like these heroic figures of the Republic, right? And uh, even though Sulla began its necrosis fundamental, um, that made this great thing. So it was easy to make these comparisons. But here, probably Amianus is trying to cover up pretty well, pretty poetically, pretty beautifully, from a literary point of view, the disaster on the Roman right wing that that collapsed. And uh, because um, he was the general Mitridates, because he became exhausted by the violence of the conflict and was deserted by all of his soldiers, he ran to the foremost rank and seizing a standard, he turned it against the enemy, exclaiming, "Go, ye once chosen companions of my dangers! And when you are asked where I, your general, was left, tell them this truth alone in Boeotia, fighting for all of us." to his own destruction, right? So this was the epitome of heroism. And Amianus is trying to make of a, of a bit of an a bit of an analogy of of Julian in this occasion. So yeah. Uh, and and it's funny because the same Amianus writes afterwards, the Alemanni, when our cavalry had been thus driven back and thrown into confusion, attacked the first line of our infantry, expecting to find their spirit abated to be able to rout them without much resistance. Now we don't see why, um, you know, the here uh, Amianus um, doesn't talk specifically about any part, um, I mean, uh, about any specific part of the Germanic formation, but we've seen that the infantry was all in the center, right? Um, so, um, wait a second. Oh no, wait. Wait, this is me mistaken. Here is probably referring to cavalry, even though he he doesn't explain that, right? So, basically, there's a bit of a contradiction. That's where it's difficult to follow Amianus, and you realize that he's working on this a, a little, uh, you know, rather too much, um, because he's saying that all this was happening before Julian recalled the troops. So let's be honest about it: that the Roman left wing had had broke. Um, and probably now the, the German cavalry and light infantry that made uh, the left flank re reversed against the, um, the the Roman infantry at this point, the Roman flank, trying to, out, to outflank in it fundamentally speaking. So it's possible, as we were saying before, part of the cavalry would come back into battle at some point, but a few of them 
like not entire units. So uh, now the Romans are without right wing, which is pretty damn dangerous, right? And now there is one of also the b most beautiful passages from Amianus because he talks about the Barritus. Now we'll see what it is. Because but when the Alamanni came to close quarters with uh, them, that is our infantry, the Roman infantry, they found they had met an equal match. The conflict lasted long for the Cortnuti and Bracciati, veterans of the great ex uh, of great experience in war frightening even by their gestures, shouted their battle cry, the Barritus, and the uproar through the heat of the conflict rising up from a gentle murmur and becoming gradually louder and louder, grew fierce as that of waves dashing against the rocks. The javelins hissed as they flew higher and tighter through the air. The dust rose to the sky, in one vast cloud, preventing all possibility of seeing and causing arms to fall upon arms, men upon men. Now, this is one of the most beautiful um, uh, mentions of uh, the Barritus. Uh, of these troops that were of Celtic and Germanic origins uh, within the Roman Auxilia Palatina. Hmm? It's interesting that Amianus says that these troops were veterans of great experience in war and frightening even by their gestures probably referring maybe to, to some ethnic uh, customs they had or what they looked like uh, and so on and they start shouting this barritus that was normally uh, was more than a battle cry you know it, it was stemming now from from the barbarization of the roman army you know that the romans were famous originally because they they were silent before battles that these barbarians shouted in front of them that they remained like impassable um, without blinking an eye uh, because of their training at this point uh, I mean that is probably a bit too idealistic the same part of Roman let's say propaganda in itself of course the Romans uh, you know uh, rejoiced and shouted and had their own battle cries but in general they, they 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 were effectively disciplined enough not to waste so many uh, resources into that. They were framed into a bit of a more rationalized context in which the, the battle cry is typical of of a of a community uh, that that is more than just the military one, right? So, the, the, this Germanic populations and other barbarian peoples used to make this battle cry that we think were just senseless shouting and insults and stuff like that. But it was much more deep than that. Um, there were actually songs. There were battle cries and songs and chants and uh, even poetry and literature, right? It, it, it may seem difficult, but we have erased, I think, uh, largely our understanding of what sensorial is being uh, an ancient, the ancient world really was. That every, every song, everything was felt like with a value of magic, right? Uh, these barbarian populations uh, chanted their, their own gods, their own their own ancestors, right? They were calling their, their strength upon them, right? And it, th there were spells, fundamentally. The Romans had had this in the past, but now that they had lost these practices, and, and yet this, this uh, Celtic and Germanic auxiliaries did it. And this was used also not just during the battles. For example, if I'm not wrong, Tacitus writes that the Germans, after the battles, uh, when they were defeated, they came back into uh, into the woods in the nearby, so collecting their dead. And they would, you you could hear, for the, from these woods coming this chants, these songs, they were so deep, and you can imagine Lugubrius now collecting their 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 their, their, their dead fundamentally. But essentially guiding them to the afterlife and and, and chanting their, their 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 deeds, singing their deeds. So it's very deep. It's very beautiful. And and Amianus that probably had heard of this um, first person tells us how it began. It, be it began like a, a gentle murmur. It, it didn't begin like a battle cry, like well, like that. Uh, it was not like like even the Roman troops that Julian said before they were 
uh, banging the, 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 the swords and spears against their shields. And also the barbarians did something like that. This was different. This is starts as a gentle murmur, like or something like that, right? And it has a psychological effect, right? It, it, it grows, it becomes louder and louder, it grew fierce. Uh, like the waves dashing against the cliffs, like this is what Miano says, and it's beautiful, this is a beautiful picture, it's uh, a roar, right, it's something that ter terrifying, that shakes the hair, that hisses, now it, this is pretty tough, before we mentioned the, the Draco as a battle standard, and that was the same thing, the Draco was this uh, battle standard that this um, was essentially adopted at this point both by the Germans and the Romans after having fought against the Sarmatians in the Nubian regions. And, and this was beautiful because it was the head of a dragon um, that, that represented this uh, Indo-European um, uh, dragon slash snake-like figure that like the Ultra, the Vedic Ultra, or the, the also the Germans had that very often, uh, the Hydra in the Hellenic tradition. Um, that gave the same name to the, <coughs> excuse me, as a people like the Sarmatians that used them, uh, an equestrian population that takes its name from the Sauromatai, that in Greek means the, like the Saurus is the this this the the snake, the lizard, the the this reptile, right? That they use in fact as their um, totemic symbol and in their battle standards. And and this Draco was literally. Um, open. It functioned like an instrument when you, you went on horseback with it, the air entered in the mouth of the dragon and started hissing. So causing this uh, this terrific sound that uh, that sometimes it was realized, even with, with arrows, like they were built in a certain way, it's like a bit the stukas like in World War II, like, like something like that. You know, that that's terrifying. That, sh that, that, that must be terrible to experience in 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 real person, um, and 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 warfare is done largely by this stuff. So what here the um, the 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 Cornuti and the Brachiati are able to do is is great. They have to basically they are on the as as we've seen on the right end of the first line of the Roman army. Now uh, their right wing is is uh, routed and the Germans pour on them. So they start uh, this chant as uh, as a sort of uh, spiritual like a uh, even for not just scaring the enemy but loading them charging themselves like and um and Amianus makes like sort of uh, uh drap covering all of this because it says a dust rose to the sky in one vast cloud preventing all possibility of seeing causing arms to fall upon arms and men upon men so he cuts in this and um it's intended that, that they they go into battle, right, in this uh, kind of a chaotic, enigmatic thing. But but it's pretty damn, uh, uh, you know, you know that th that was a pretty tough moment. He doesn't expand more on it, but uh, um, now he he follows. He he tells about what what combat was like. He says. But the barbarians, in their undisciplined anger and fury, raged like the flames, and with the uh, ceaseless blows of their swords sought to pierce through the compact mass of the shields with which our soldiers defended themselves, as with the testudo, this is the, the term that he uses, even though the testudo, many people think it's a sort of uh, battle formation, the testudo is not a battle formation, I mean, it serves to... Um, to protect for missile troops, it wasn't actually used in combat. What is being used in here, that Amianus calls as the pseudo, was the Fulcon as we have defined it before, is something similar because um, it's it's aimed at basically forming a shield wall and still covering your heads while you are. But it's very different from the pseudo. Instead, is like uh, the best solution at a desperate in an emergential situation where you can't find better and it's mostly aimed just at missile halting missile fire this formation is dead uh, that also the Germans use in part because the the term Fulcon also comes from Volk which means people in, uh, in in Germany and it was typical in fact in, but also the Celts used similar similar stuff so 
every people is clever enough to uh, to form a shield wall like every tribal population like the Alamanni just like in here can do that and at the same time using uh, shields over your head to protect yourself from missile fire right and and here uh, the fight goes on and uh, Amiano says and when this was seen, the Batavi, with the Royal Legion, hastened to support of their comrades, a formidable band, well able, if fortune aided them, to save even those who were in, in the extremest danger. And amid the fierce notes of their trumpets, the battle again raged with undiminished ferocity. Hmm. So these other guys enter into the fight. Um, and going on, but the Alamanni is still charging forward impetuously, strove more and more vigorously, hoping to bear down all opposition by the violence of their fury. Darts, spears, and javelins never ceased. Arrows pointed with iron were shot. While at the same time, in hand-to-hand -hand conflict, sword struck, sword breastplates were cloven, and even the wounded, if not quite exhausted with the loss of blood, rose up still to deeds of greater daring. Right? So this is really the heat of battle. Wh what is interesting here is that the Alamanni are relieving all of their strengths, right? Um, almost all of them. They, they are still preserving the elite, as we will see now. Uh, and um, and what is interesting is also that uh, it says that uh, darts, spears, and javelins never ceased, right? Uh, arrows, fly, uh, etc. Iron points. Sometimes Germans at this point still used, uh, like maybe not at this point, but up to a few centuries ago, they still used like stone arrowheads because they didn't have much of metal. Now they they were they were more than that. But but it's interesting that the the uh, both sides apparently had all of this firepower, right? Um, and, and and the Romans as well, of course. Uh, and, and they were seemingly on equal ground. In fact, Amianus writes, in some sense it may be said that the combatants were equal. The Alamanni were the stronger and the taller men. Our soldiers, by great practice, were the more skillful. The one were, were fierce and savage, the others composed and wavery. The one trusted to, to their courage, the others to their physical strength. Often, so this is the, the usual cliche right you know the the Germans that are taller and and, and stronger and the Romans that are uh, more trained and, and more skillful right uh, it's, uh, the, the Germans were fierce and savage and the Romans were composed and way right the, the one trusted to their courage the others to their physical strength like it's um, um, it's important because it's the myth of the resilience of the Roman soldier and the, the strength of the, the, the barbarian, right? It's, uh, it's, it's the clash against, it also exists in the Indo-European mythology between the, uh, you know, the, the gods and the giants, like this idea of the, the warriors put an order through intelligence in some form on the this, uh, forces of nature that are equated, like the giants, the, the Germans are compared to, the giants were figures of the ancient mythology that were in fact this uh, now it's complicated to explain, but uh, they, they represented the, the, in fact, the kind of a irrational element, like uh, the la uh, the land, etc. But uh, who, who knows what what the <laughs> the Germans actually thought? Because the Germans actually didn't think to be at all inferior compared to the Romans as warriors, right? They 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 measured Roman skill and they knew what it was about, but still they believed it to be the best, right? But we don't have their <laughs> their their witness. Uh, so going on often indeed the Roman soldier was beaten down by the weight of his enemy's arms but he constantly rose again and then on the other hand the barbarian finding his knees fail under him with fatigue would rest his left knee on the ground and even in that position attack his enemy and act extreme uh, an extreme obstinacy. Now, this is very interesting because we've seen the, the Germans kicking, etc., and, and that exhausted the, or so the, their legs, muscles. So what it seems to be suggesting here is that it's not that the guy kept fighting, like kneeling, uh, but that they would maybe come back to the, the ranks and uh, knee uh, and 
I don't know, grab a spear or a pike and uh, and hold there, uh, like having that that role uh, in case the the Romans would have charged. Like, uh, I think it's more realistic. And going on, presently there sprang forward with sudden vigor a fiery band of nobles, among whom also were the princes of the petty tribes. And as the common soldiers followed them in great numbers, they burst through our lines and forced a path for themselves up to the principal legion of the reserve, which was stationed in the center in a position called the Praetorian Camp. And there the soldiery, being in closer array and in densely serried ranks, stood firm as so many towers and renewed the battle with increased spirit. And intent upon pairing the blows of the enemy, and covering themselves with their shields of the Mirbillos too, with their drawn swords wounded their antagonists in the sides with uh, which their too vehement impetuosity left unprotected. This is also very interesting because now the uh, the mess happens, right? And and the way Amianus uh, describes this is pretty ambiguous in the sense that we've seen that he has already tried to conceal essentially the uh, the defeat of the Roman cavalry. Now the real mess happens because basically the Germans, if you are understood here, breaking through the first and most important Roman line. Uh, so basically the, 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 the German impetus manages to break the Roman lines. This tells you how damn effective were Alemannic charges at this point in history, right? And um, it's it's great and this happens because the noblemen so the best troops um, um, uh, followed by their 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 retinues and their their clients their, their the other tribes charge right in, in through the into the center of the enemy um, of, of, of the enemy line and, and they break it and this is uh, really uh, serious. Like basically, your your war, your Roman formation loses uh, the the core of it. They attack in the center position called the Praetorian, um, and um, excuse me, in, in the center of the lines, and they they pass through them literally, and they arrive into the reserves. Fundamentally, they are close to the Roman camp. Uh, that that uh, I mean on the camp the encampment that the Romans had on on the hill on top of the hill from which they had arrived right, and at this point what happens is that the Romans send in the reserves of course or better the, the Germans here says that they arrive to the second line, practically, and um, and there is a tough situation in which basically here the um, the enemy the, the Romans pair the uh, are equated to Mirmillo gladiators they because the Mirmillo was a gladiator opposed to the Rizziarius that protected himself by uh, this oblong shield against the net of the latter so here um, it, it's talking about the Romans resisting to the very heavy blows of the Germans uh, these are noblemen many of them have swords and these are pretty damn uh, you know good troops so very physically apt. I mean, like the, the noblemen would spend more than other troops their their, their life uh, training with weapons and fighting, etc. So um, it's pretty it's pretty serious, and that's why um, Amiano stresses it properly. And um, and and yet he says uh, that the Romans managed also to 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 hit. Uh, with the with the Roman swords, the enemy from the sides, right? Uh, because the too vehement impetuosity um, of the Germans had left uh, their s flanks unprotected. This may mean a lot of things, um, such as the fact that the, yes, the Germans might have mm, broken through the the first line of the Roman army, but still um, they they would some sort of lose their cohesion like th this would go very very easily especially for troops that lack collective training that they 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 scatter themselves around maybe because they thought that um, they would they, they had won here 
we don't know actually about the rest of the first line if they were still holding but you know if the center if the very best center um, breaks uh, well also the rest of the troops are probably pretty pretty you know in trouble right even the the auxilia palatina on, on the flanks probably now they are like the left flank probably is doing f is faring better because Severus is still there but the ones on the right that Amianus, uh, the the Cornuti and the Brachiati, you know, they're probably in a pretty tough situation. Um, <coughs> and um, so Amianus resolves this very, uh, very easily. He says, and, and does the barbarians throw away their lives in their struggles for victory while toiling to break the compact array of our battalions? But still, in spite of the ceaseless slaughter made among them by the Romans, whose courage rose with the, their success, fresh barbarians succeeded those who fell. And as the frequent groans of the dying were heard, many became panic striking and lost all strength. It's very important because uh, it, it basically this situation starts to be reversed. So basically the, the Roman reserve manages to absorb uh, the, the German attack. The Germans at this point might have been uh, realistically exhausted. I mean, if they had thrown in their, their elite, um, I mean, obviously they were counting on it to, to solve the battle, but it was kind of still kind of the last resort. So these battles were quite balanced in general, and the fact that the Germans had to recur to the elite mean, meant that that was, um, I mean, now or never, right? And uh, they they make this tremendous effort through what they were saying, charge to, to break un to the first Roman line, but they're held by the fresh reserves of the second line that managed to start butchering them down, right? And they start being exhausted by the losses, by the, you know, it, it starts being uh, very, very, very hard. And in fact, uh, Amianus says, at last, exhausted by their losses and having no strength for anything but flight, they sought to escape with all speed by different roads like a sailor and traders, when the sea rages in a storm, are glad to flee wherever the wind carries them. But any of, uh, of them present will confess that escape was a matter rather to be wished than hoped for. Right? And the merciful protection of a favorable deity was present on our side, so that our soldiers now slashing at, at the backs of the fugitives and finding their swords so battered that they were insufficient to wound, used the enemy's own javelins and so slew them. Nor could any one of the pursuers satiate himself enough with their blood, nor allow his hand to wear his, uh, with slaughter, nor did any one spare a suppliant out of pity." So, here the, uh, uh, Amianus reverses, like, the, the even the Romans that had, that had hit so much that they had their swords bent, and they take the, the, the 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 Germanic javelins, which is interesting because uh, yeah, probably you've seen how many darts were around and uh, to to kill them, to kill the end, the fleeing enemy. It is fleeing at this point, right? They want to get out of there, and they start retreating. So the tides have turned now, and the Romans start massacring, right? So here, obviously, the the, the story is that the Romans have to to wash this. Um, um, offense of the fact that the Germans had invaded their own the, the, the empire with, with blood, right? So here it gets very bloody because it, it is realistically the moment of the battle in which more dead occur, right? There's the the, the, the Alamanni are many, and they, are lo they have lost cohesion, they're retreating, so now they're easy to butcher down. They're exhausted, so you can't run after them as well. Um, Amianus goes on and says, Numbers therefore lay on the ground, mortally wounded, imploring instant death as a relief. Others, half dead, with feigning breath, turned their dying eyes to the last enjoyment of the light. Right, so it's pretty dark. Uh, of some of the heads were almost cut off by the huge weapons and merely hung by the small strips to their necks. Others, again, who had fallen because of the ground, had been rendered slippery by the blood of their comrades without themselves received any wound, were killed by being smothered in the mass of those who fell over them. Like, this is plain butchery, right? It's very dark, 
God, yeah, blood, people beheaded. Like it, it's massive. Like it, this is really, it's very realistic telling the truth, and um, and Amianus enjoys writing this evenly, and uh, but it's pretty realistic. Like and you have to think, in fact, especially in. Like, uh, th this is a clash that is resolved chiefly by infantry. So wh what happens normally in this chance is in, in this occasion is that with such intense fight among infantry that the corpus, corpus are really concentrated on, on one point. Like, they start becoming even a uh, an obstacle for people who want to retreat. I mean, it's really realistic, right? And uh, they have to come back objectively. If these are infantrymen, the, the Alemanni are infantrymen who have to come back on foot on the place that they have fought in to, to break the, the Roman line. So it's this path of blood, of people killed everywhere. It, it's, it's in, uh, I mean, there's no way to describe this. It's hell. Um, and Amianus goes on and says, While these events were proceeding thus prosperously for us, the conquerors pressed on vigorously, though the edges of their weapons um, uh, uh, were blunted by frequent hues, and shining helmets and shields were trampled underfoot. At least in the extremity of their distress, the barbarians finding the heaps of corpses block all, up all the paths, uh, the paths sought the aid of the river, which was the only hope left to them, and which they had now reached. And because our soldiers unweariedly um, and with great speed pressed for the arms in their hands upon the fleeing bands, many hoping to be able to deliver themselves from danger by their skill in swimming, trusted their lives to the waves. And Julian, with the prompt apprehension seeing what would be the result, strictly forbade the tribunes and captains to allow any of our men to pursue them so eagerly as to trust themselves to the dangerous, dangerous current of the river. Uh, yeah. So it's not a great option to, to fight with a with a river in your uh, at your back, but uh, yeah, that's how uh, confident the Alemanni had been previously. Um, and in consequence of which order, they halted on the brink, and from it wounded uh, the Germans with every kind of missile. Right, so th the Germans are trying to pass the river, and the Romans arrive to the banks and start uh, hitting them with missile. While if any of them escaped from that of that kind by the celerity of their movements, they still sunk to the bottom from the weight of their own arms. Right? This is probably true, especially of the of the noblemen. Right? And um, you can imagine also. Uh, here uh, goes on and says, and as sometimes in a theatrical spectacle, the court and exhibits marvelous figures. So here one could see many strange things in that danger. Some unconsciously clinging to others who were good swimmers, others who were floating were pushed off by those less encumbered as so many logs, ag others again, as if the violence of the stream itself fought against them, were swallowed up in the eddies. Some supported themselves on their shields, avoiding the heaviest attacks on the opposing waves by crossing them in an oblique d direction and so after many dangers reached the opposite brink till at last the foaming river discolored with barbarian blood was itself amazed at the unusual increase it had received right you know um a bit exaggerated but it's realistic at least in the in the measure uh, of, of uh, the um you know uh, how b people would, would behave in the river right so the Rhine is still large there is already large there and um it's uh, it's realistic overall right and while this was going on uh, uh, this is so it, then it cuts to Chrono Marius that interestingly enough has his own story in here that is traced. Maybe one thing that I, I didn't insist particularly on is that when the reserve absorbs the, the rest of, and, and maybe because it's it was not written in here, I think it was uh, either Libanius or Zosimus, but uh, here I think I forgot to, to track it, I don't know why. Is that it says that the, the, the field aids from the Roman hill uh, from from the Roman encampment on the hill uh, went down to help the reserve as well. So a very desperate mo moment. You can imagine what this battle had been, right? 
uh, in, in, the c in, in combat proper. Now th these guys now ha have fled, they have even reached the, the Rhine and uh, they're being they're dying, if not butchered by the Romans, they're drowning into the river. So cutting to Knodomarius, <laughs> it's interesting. And while this was going on, Knodomarius, the king, finding an opportunity of escaping, making his way over the heaps of dead with a small escort, hastened with exceeding speed towards the camp which he had made near to the Roman fortress of Altstadt and Lauterburg. Of course these are modernized names of different uh, cities were called in a different way at the time. Um, in the country of the three Bocci, that he might embark in some boats which had already been prepared in case of any emergency and so escape, but it's clever, and so escape to some secret hiding place in which he might conceal himself. And because it was impossible for him to reach his camp without crossing the Rhine, he hid his face that he might not be recognized and after that, uh, it, that retreated slowly. So he basically had smeared his face with mud or something like that. And then he, he managed to 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 to, uh, to, to re escape, and when he got near the bank of the river, as he was feeling his way round a marsh, partly overflowed, sneaking some path by which to cross it, his horse suddenly stumbled in some soft and sticky place, and he was thrown down. But though he was fat and heavy, he without delay reached the shelter of a hill in the neighborhood. There he was recognized, for indeed he could not conceal who he was, being betrayed by the greatness of his fo uh, former fortune. And immediately a squadron of cavalry came up, at uh, came up at full gallop with its tribune and cautiously surrounded the, uh, the wooden mound. Though they feared to enter the th thickest, uh, thicket lest they should fall into an ambuscade concealed among the trees. But when he saw them, he was seized with extreme terror, and of his own accord came forth by himself and surrendered, and his companions, two hundred in number, and, this, um, and his three most intimate friends, thinking it would be a crime in them to survive their king, or not to die for him in occasion required, gave themselves up also as prisoners. This is very important because um, in the in, in Germanic warfare, uh, the idea of being faithful to your uh, chief was um, to your warlord was uh, like of extreme import was paramount. It was very important uh, in absolute terms. It's it this bonds is what um, in the absence of a more um, robust uh, central structure kept the clientels together, right? Especially this sense that also every warrior in battle had to be equal to 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 um, uh, achieve the same deeds of the of of uh, his commander because otherwise it would have been a shame to be uh, less courageous than him and it was deeply felt so these guys decide uh, d decide to 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 hand themselves prisoners and uh, apparently they didn't have much of a choice least reading th this passage, but at least to share the same fate of their own leader, because um, dying, for example, if, if you know if your leader died in the battle, it's because you hadn't protected him, and you hadn't died before him, so your other option was to die with him. So in this case, it was to to follow his own uh, same uh, fate and surrendering together with him and not abandoning. Of course, the other two hundred Germanic wars were there. In the woods, who knows? But uh, it seems that they didn't have much of an option there; that they would be surrounded by the Romans as well. Um, in Amianus goes on and says, "As barbarians are naturally low-spirited in adverse fortune and very much uh, their averse in moments of prosperity, so now that he was in the power of another, he came pale and confused, his consciousness of guilt closing his mouth." widely different from him lately insulting the ashes of the Gauls with ferocious and lamentable violence, poured forth savage threats against the whole empire. Right. So he was uh dumb, like he 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 didn't speak anymore. 
yeah, after this disaster. Just imagine, even psychologically speaking, what it means to lose your your entire army. I mean, the, the army of your entire people. Like, think of all the consequences that this has, and aside from the shock, the trauma, and seeing all that people died, and the fear of dying, and this escape, and physical exhaustion. Um, I mean, it, it's indescribable. Like, I, I per... But try to, to think at this aspects because they are really what they count. And, and of course, the shame here to, to surrender, like the acceptance of fact of living on, but with this shame of having, you know, having failed badly and having, you know, every great warrior had to, to fall on his sword and on this, this occasion. Instead, he surrendered. And Amiris goes on and says, now after these affairs were thus by the favor of the deity brought to an end, the victorious soldiers were recalled at the close of the day to their camp by the signal of the trumpeter, and marched towards the bank of the Rhine, and there erecting a rampart of shield, uh, shields piled together in several rows, they refreshed themselves with food and sleep. Right, finally. Think about the exhaustion after a day like that day. I mean, that... Surely nobody forgot that day of those who took part in you know, and many other people also would. Um, so here, address the body count. Um, that is, uh, let's read. There fell in this battle of Romans two hundred forty-three and four generals, by Nobaudus, the tribune of the Cornuti, and uh, with him Lipso and Innocentius who commanded the the cataphracts, and one tribune who had no particular command and whose na uh, name I forget, <laughs> uh, well, he was honest, at least, uh, poor guy, he died in there and nobody remembered his name. Um, but of the Alamanni there were found 6,000 corpses on the field, hmm? and incalculable numbers were carried down by the waves of the river. Right, so... Then Julian, as one who was now manifestly approved by fortune, and was also greater in his merit than uh, even he in his authority, was by unanimous acclamation hailed as Augustus by the soldiers, but he sharply reproved them for so doing, affirming with an oath that he neither wished for such an honor nor, nor he would accept it. This echoes easily Tacitus' uh, analysis when Germanicus is offered to become emperor and he refuses because he was loyal to Tiberius and uh, all the story like uh, so this is very easy also because it was fighting against the same Germans right so it came very easy and uh, concluding we can say this last um, paragraph in order to increase the joy at his recent success Julian ordered Cnodo Marius to be brought before him at his council who at first bowing and then like a suppliant prostrating himself on the ground and imploring pardon with entreaties framed after the fashion of his nation was bidden to take courage right okay we can stop here now uh, about the body count actually and the losses um, Amianus talks about this 6,000 bodies right uh, Libanius says 8,000 and Zosimus says 60,000, but it's absurd, but Zosimus is uh, it's not to be, uh, it's obviously not externally reliable, it's more distant from the events. So between six and 8,000 losses, it's a lot, considering, by the way, the body count doesn't involve the people who drowned in the Rhine, right, so we don't know that. So, however, this is a massive slaughter, right, uh, it's not a few, uh, the Alemanni were massively defeated. Now, about the Roman losses, only 243, who knows, right? Um, uh, it's difficult to tell. Uh, we weren't there. There is no way to say, okay, this is wrong, this is right. Of course, you can't say, who knows? Maybe it's likely wrong. Uh, people think the Romans suffered more losses, but there is no other evidence, so who knows? Um, and 243 is not, I mean, 13,000 soldiers is not so few, after all, um, in general. Uh, but you know, for a victorious army, right, uh, it can do. Um, so, uh, naturally, Amianus can be commented a little bit in the way it doesn't seem to be uh, a clear explanation how the, the tides were turned. He spends a lot of time telling the uh, Julian's uh, speeches and, and all this stuff. Uh, 
But after all, he's realistic, I mean, he's plausible, he's telling a battle that kind of makes sense, aside from what happened on the right wing and uh, also what how this uh, reflected on the rest of the army. Probably the battle didn't go like this. Um, probably, um, um, I mean, it probably, I mean, it's plausible that it went like this, but it, we're not told the whole story like what happened precisely on the right flank or whether this was just breaking at the center I mean it, I mean it might have probably gone also possibly gone also in this way but uh, it's a story and as such we have to, to to tell us that the battle happened that the Almani were defeated is 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 uh, you know it's it's real because uh, we know that they, they they were halted and they they were put um, to their place and uh, this was one of the greatest triumphs of Julian and uh, indeed um, uh, however the Romans might have suffered more losses in this battle would have been a bit more complicated um, what to say um, this is we, we have highlighted the, the major aspects I mean the, the, the Germanic impetus the charge were some of the worst challenges the Romans could meet on the Western Front. Um, uh, they somewhat halted it, right? Uh, the cataphracts do a very poor have performance, right? Um, and this also stays in line with the Roman trend. Um, yeah, and um, we don't get many other details. If not, we know that even missile fire was very important in general. And this is, this is the significance of the battle. It's essentially the, the, the proof that a 4th century army could withstand in open field uh, the onslaught of a, uh, one of the largest Germanic confederations and uh, defeating them. Right. It's very important from a strategical point of view, not just from a tactical one. And this victory was one of the victories that ensured the empire kind of a more prosperous um, uh, future for, for a while, right? And things could go seriously worse. I mean, the, the Alemanni even invaded Italy I mean, in the previous century. I mean, it was a... There were a serious problem. It would remain there, though. So, quite a long video today, um, there would be a lot to add, evidently, but I think we don't have much time now. Um, and um, I, I think we can't stop here. This was the tactical history of the Battle of Strasbourg. Um, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.